Hello you lovely cubs, it's the Dragon Lord here back again with another video. Now, this is a movie uh, movie video. <laughs> the first one on my channel, in fact. It is What If uh, Tanjiro's Kokoshiba Sun, the movie, so the entire series compiled into one episode. Now, if you like this series and this episode and this movie at all, like and subscribe. If you're new around here, do that as well, and well, yeah, just comment down below what you think of the what if and with that any further ado join the discord and join the roblox group they are at the top of the description and with that out of the way let's get into it Our story starts with Kibutsuji Muzan. He had heard rumors of a woman and her father living on a snowy mountain. Now this woman and her father didn't interest him that much, but what did interest him is that the father wore certain Hanafura earrings. Now this had made him recall some bad trauma, and because of this he wanted them dead, for no other reason besides them wearing the earrings. He had called upon his most powerful subject, Kokoshibo, aka Upper Moon One, and when Kokoshibo arrived and bowed before his master, he spoke. Go to Mount Kumotori and slay the family living there. He spoke with a calm but intimidating voice. I shall, Kokoshibo said, departing shortly after. Kokoshibo decided to hide his appearance by trying to look as much like a human as he could. He would hide his four extra eyes and instead of using his flesh sword, he would get back his old Nitrin blade which he had discarded many years before. He didn't really know why he did this, but he still just did it. For whatever reason, I guess it was more fun. I mean, he had been living for over 400 years at this point. The sword had a golden handle whilst having a black cord wrap around it. It had a black guard with gold lined on the edges, and the blade itself had a black back. The edge was a nice purplish blue, almost like the night sky, and it had a repeating pattern along the middle of the blade, which were these yellow almost round circles that looked like the moon. He set out at night, and after traveling for two nights he arrived at his destination. He liked this mountain, it snowed a lot and well the sun got obstructed a lot by the trees. This meant that he could maybe come outside in the daytime from time to time. It's what he thought until he remembered what he came to do. He knocked on the door of the shack he had found. Is somebody there? A voice that was calm and sweet said. It struck Kokoshibo for a second. Uh, yeah, could I maybe come inside? I'm traveling by here and it's pretty dangerous at night, Kokoshibo said calmly. Oh, uh, hold on a minute, the voice would say, shortly after the door would open and Kokoshibo was struck. Standing in front of him was probably the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, a slender figure with a pretty face. Not only that, but her eyes were reminding him of his brothers, which made him feel both angry and happy for some reason. The woman had a nice black to red hair color with beautiful dark red eyes. Kokoshibo was stunned. He couldn't speak for a second. She had a pretty nasty scar on her forehead, but Kokoshibo just thought that it made her look tough. She wasn't wearing any earrings, like Muzan said, so Kokoshibo thought that the rumors might be false, and that he might have been at the wrong house. Are you just gonna stand there, or are you gonna come inside? The woman would speak calmly. It brought Kokoshibo back to his senses as he entered the house. Are you a samurai? The woman asked, noticing Kokoshibo's sword. Yeah, I am. He answered as he took off his shoes. It gave him a few memories from his past for some reason. May I know your name? He asked. He was quite intrigued by this woman. 
It's Tanjiko Kamado, she said shortly after she would ask him, May I know yours? Kokoshibo being polite answered. Of course, he answered his old human name. It's Michikatsu Tsujikuni. She then proceeded to pour him some tea and give him a place to rest. They spoke all night and Kokoshibo didn't really see any danger in her. The next morning was pretty snowy, so Kokoshibo could go outside without worrying about the sun. He spent all morning and night talking with Tanjiko. He felt like a burden had been taken off of his shoulders, and he felt like he could talk to her freely. Now they would be sitting inside, and Kokoshibo, with his enhanced demon senses, would hear footsteps outside. He put his hand on his sword, much to Tanjiko's confusion. There's somebody outside, he would say whilst getting into a sword stance. Tanjiko would place her hand on his and say, That's probably my father. He goes out every now and then to sell charcoal. Kokoshibo let down his guard, but when the door opened, he instantly put his hand back on his sword. Standing in front of him was an old man, probably around his sixties, his appearance matching that of Kokoshibo's younger brother, Yoroichi, in his older years. The man saw Kokoshibo's shock, fear, and anger. The distance between the two was covered before Kokoshibo could even react, and the old man just put his hand on Kokoshibo's shoulder as he said, There's no reason to be on guard here. We're just a simple charcoal burning family, the man said. Kokoshibo calmed down even though the speed this man just displayed was beyond him. The words made him calm. The man wearing the Hanafuda earrings was Kokoshibo's target, although he wasn't sure if he could take on the man after he had displayed his speed. Why don't you stay for a few days? It's gonna snow a lot in the following week. It would be hard even for a samurai like yourself to travel through that weather, the old man said, leaving to the pantry to restock their supplies. The man was definitely at an old age, yet he still had the mark, resembling that of Hiroichi. His appearance stunned Kokoshibo the most, yet he didn't feel any hatred or anything like that towards himself. He decided to stay for a few more days to gouge if they were a threat or not. In those days, he stayed at, Kam at the Kamado residence. He grew closer and closer to Tanjiko, and before he knew it, m months flew by. He obviously couldn't go out in the sun, so his excuse for not coming outside was that he had a bad skin disease. The Kamado family accepting this, eventually he got close enough to Tanjiko, and they married, and after a few years flew by, they had a kid. A boy, in fact. They named him Tanjiro. Now, Tanjiro was born stronger than a normal kid, and he actually had a mark when he was born. Now this mark resembled that of his grandfather, but that was only half of his mark. The other half was situated on his neck, which resembled his father's. Now when Tanjiro was a baby, it was hard for him to go outside in the sunlight. At first they thought that he might have his father's skin disease, but really quickly it became apparent that he was fine. He could run around in the sun. Now, Tantra was special because if he got hurt, his wound would heal pretty fast. Tantra also displayed a level of physical strength equal to that of at least two sumo wrestlers, when he was only four years old. Now, this in itself was shocking to the family. That, combined with his regenerative powers, made Tantra quite the special boy. Now, about eight years would pass where Kokoshibo would be living his life alongside his family. His wife was weakened and he knew this was because of the mark, but he couldn't tell her that. Tantro wasn't their only kid after all, there was Nezuko, Takio, Hanako, Shigeru, and Rokuta. Tantro's grandfather would always perform the Inokami Kagura dance in the winter, which Kokoshiba always observed. After all, it was a dance based off of sun breathing. He knew this, but he didn't say anything. Now, Tantra would always try to mimic the dance, and eventually his grandfather taught him how, even how to use the breathing technique. Now, Kokoshiba would also teach Tantra sword fighting and sword techniques, specifically moon breathing. Now, Tantra would always pay attention to his father's lessons so that he could one day protect his family. At age 7, Tantra was already so strong both in moon breathing and just overall sword skills that Kokoshiba would compare him to a Hashura. Sadly, at age 10, Tanjiro's mother passed away due to her body being too frail, and she passed shortly after giving birth to Rokuta. When Tanjiro was 11 years old, his grandfather also passed away. He would often help out by carrying the charcoal when his grandfather made the trips down the mountain. 
His grandfather often told him tales about demons, and was really that fun grandfather that everybody loves. So when he passed, Tanjiro was quite sad, but he kept up a good front. After all, he had to help his family now the most. He would of course have the Hanafuda earrings that he got from his grandfather, and he would perform the Hinoka Mikagura every year to honor the fire god in his grandfather's stead. Kokushibo was proud of his son. After all, he was such a hard-working boy, and he was quite gifted as well. For example, Tanjiro's smell was astonishingly good. Now, all of their senses were quite strong, but Tanjiro was always the strongest out of all of them, by far too. But his smell far surpassed even Kokoshibo's Upper Moon one sense of smell. Tanjiro and his father were quite close, but Tanjiro would often make remarks about his father having a weird smell on him. He would often ask his father about the demon stories he had heard, but Kokoshibo always dismissed them. After all, Tanjiro was taught that demons are evil. What if he figures out his father is one? Two more years quickly passed and the family was getting along well. Tanjiro had gotten half of his father's haori, and his father always wore half of Tanjiro's. It was to show their bond. And Kokoshibo explained to his son that it shows that he is a moon-breathing student. Tanjiro also got gifted Kokoshibo's old katana, him wanting his son to carry his legacy. Tanjiro graciously accepted, and he started training with it every day. That winter was probably the happiest the Kamado family had been even though all the grief they had gone through, but whilst they were enjoying themselves, Kokoshibo heard a voice. Come now. It was Master Muzan. Later that night, Kokoshibo set out. Before leaving though, Tanjiro would notice him leaving, as he wished his father well, which almost brought tears to Kokoshibo's eyes, as he bowed down in front of his son and said, Protect our family whilst I'm gone, okay? He said with a smile. Of course, that's what you trained me for, isn't it? Tanjiro said with a smile. Kokoshibo then set out, and soon found himself in the Infinity Castle. Surrounded around him were the other Upper Moon Demons, and in front of him the progenitor of all demons himself, Muzan Kibutsuji. It has come to my attention that you have failed in your mission, Kokoshibo, Muzan would say intimidatingly. Instantly, the atmosphere in the area was heavy. The other demons were shaking. The woman and her father are dead, master. I don't understand, Kokoshibo would say. Not only did you not kill them, you left the children alive, Muzan would say infuriated. The children, master? Kokoshibo would be confused. I saw your memories, Kokoshibo. What was his name? Tanjiro. The evidence is right there on your body, Muzan would say, and in a flash he would grab Kokoshibo by the left side of his haori, which was Tanjiro's piece. Master Muzan, you want me to kill my own son, Kokoshibo would say, infuriated at the thought. They are offspring of that devil. Either they become demons under my control or they die, Muzan said in a cold tone. In a flash, Muzan's arm would be cut off, without him even realizing it. In front of him, an angered Kokoshibo was holding his sword, looking at him in disdain. I will follow you, but you leave my children out of this. They will not interfere with your plan. You dare! A female voice would speak. Looking over, we see Daki infuriated at the sight of Kokoshibo slashing at Muzan. However, Muzan would raise his hand in objection to her statement. Kokoshibo was pretty much even in power with Muzan, and he wouldn't want to lose a powerful subordinate like Kokoshibo. You have one year to change them into demons, or I will kill them all myself, Muzan would say, infuriated. Kokoshibo would just nod in silence, and would return the next night. Upon seeing his family, he knew he couldn't turn them into demons. It would break his heart, seeing them slave away under a person. He thought for a while and came to a conclusion. His conclusion was to simply think about it tomorrow. Tomorrow turned into next week, next week turned into next month, and eventually a year had passed. That morning, Tanjiro had met up with his family before leaving to sell his charcoal. Before leaving, he found his father looking at him with a worried expression. I'll be alright, Dad. After all, I learned from you, and you're the best. He said with a smile that warmed his dad's cold, demonic heart. Shortly after, he would depart and start descending down the mountain. He would look at the scenery around him and take a breath. This was home. 
Although he wanted to just sit here and look at the trees covered in snow, he knew he had to continue on. After all, he still had to go get Nezuko her new dress. He arrived at the village which was situated at the bottom of the mountain. Instantly greeting him were some people that he often helped out. Tondra was quite popular in the village. His greater sense of Sunel had helped many people out in the past. He would often help people carry stuff, and when traveling merchants passed by, he'd sometimes get hired as protection. Tondro's good looks also put him in favor with many of the girls in town, although he never really picked up on any of their hints. Today he would start helping out again, as he took a sniff of a broken vase which led to the perpetrator who broke it being a cat. People would often buy a piece of charcoal after he helped them out. Now he generally would just help out to help out. The day would quickly pass by and night time would fall. Tondro is just about to make his way up the mountain, but he gets stopped by one of the village elders. The elder offers him a place for the night, and after some debating, Tondro accepted. He ate and then went to bed. Meanwhile, at the Kamado residence, Gokoshiba would be making food for his family. His family sitting around the dining table, patiently waiting, would strike casual conversation with each other. Food's ready, Gokoshiba would say as he would place a pot on the table. It's two again, Takio would say whilst making a disgusting face. Hey, be grateful for the food we're given, Takio. If it weren't for Father and Tanjiro, we'd be at eating vegetable scraps. Nezuko would butt in as she pulled on his cheek. Now, now, eat up before dinner gets cold, Kokoshiba would say with a smile. The children would quickly fill their bowls as they would start eating. Delicious, Hanako would say as she ate. Father's cooking is always so amazing, she would continue as she chowed down on her food like a starving wild animal. Takio was also enjoying the food, but not wanting to show his delight, he tried hiding his expression. Kokoshibo just laughed as he sat down to give Rokuta his food. He would start spoon-feeding the child, but at that moment, he they heard a knock. That must be Tanjiro, Nezuko would say, and be excited to see her brother again. I'll get the door for him, Kokoshiba would say as he passed Rokuta over to Nezuko who kept feeding him. Kokoshiba would open the door and utter shock and fear came over him. Standing in front of him was not Tanjiro, in fact it was Kibutsuji Muzon, who entered the house without being invited in. So this is your family, huh? He would say with a grin on his face. Quite the adorable kids you have here, Kokoshiba. So have you changed them yet? Muzan would ask as his eyes changed to red. He obviously already knew the answer. Sweating and stuttering, Kokoshibo would answer. No, I haven't, master. He would slowly back up and put himself between Muzan and his children, as he would bow down and he would beg. Master Muzan, please, they are just children. They have nothing to do with your quest, Kokoshibo would say whilst bowing. Before Muzan could even speak, Takio would open his mouth. Who are you? And why did you enter our home without permission? He would say whilst pointing at Muzan. Quite the brave one you have there. Or is it that you haven't told them who you truly are? Muzan would point at Kokoshibo. Master, please, I beg of you, don't do this. Muzan, however, ignored his pleas and revealed Kokoshibo's true form. As Kokoshibo turned to look at his children, they would be horrified. Rokuta would even start crying. Him having six eyes and sharp teeth scared them. What did you do to our father? Nezuko would say as she grabbed the knife that was laying on the table and pointed it at the man. Didn't discipline them either. How have you failed me, Kokoshibo? Muzan would say, upon hearing this man refer to their father as Kokoshibo, they would be confused. Muzan, however, still pointing at Kokoshibo, started to make the Muzan cells that were inside him go crazy. Kokoshibo started bleeding through his nose and ears. Upon seeing this, Takio ran in between them, as he screamed, Stop hurting my father, you! But before he could finish his sentence, his head was smashed straight off of his body. His body fell to the ground as his head was now laying in Muzan's hand. Kokoshibo seeing this was angered, but he couldn't move due to the Muzan cells restricting his movement. How dare you! He would say whilst looking at Muzan with anger unlike any other. Although Kokoshibo was a demon, Takio still accepted him as a father. Yeah, the boy might have been stubborn and irresponsible, but that also made him unique in his own way. 
Children that don't know their place don't deserve to live, Muzan would say with a cold tone. He started walking towards the rest of the family as he dropped Hakyo's head. Kokoshibo could only look on in horror as the man sat down next to Hanako and Shigeru, with her crying because of her dead brother and the latter too scared to move. So, will you kids become my subordinates or not? Muzan spoke with an intimidating tone. The kids couldn't answer either because they were scared or because they just felt hopeless. I'll decide then. Muzan would say as he grew his claws. Reaching out to Hanako, he started transferring his blood to her. As she slowly started to turn into a demon, but Muzan didn't stop. As she started to mutate into something that wasn't even close to either a demon or a human. All Kokoshibo could do was watch as he started to cry. Stop. Please, I beg of you. You have become so pitiful, Kokoshibo. It's kind of sad, Muzan would say with a cold tone in reply. Hanako shortly after died. The only thing showing that the blob that laid there was her was the kimono which she wore, as it laid there ripped into shreds. Kokoshibo could only watch on as he was still being restricted by the cells, but in his mind he cursed at Muzan, and he started to feel pain like he had never felt before. His chest started to ache. Muzan would turn and face Shigeru, the boy too scared to even look at the man in the eyes, as he too got Muzan's blood. Before he turned into a monstrosity, he looked at his father. The words coming out of his mouth were simply, help us shortly after he died. Muzan stood up, however, before he realized that he got pierced by a blade. In front of him, an angered Kokoshibo stood as the two started to fight. Muzan would try to attack Kokoshibo, but each one of his attacks got deflected and countered. It gave Muzan trauma, as this wasn't moon breathing. And he remembered these movements from before, as he started having flashbacks of the only man that ever got close to killing him, Yoroichi. Although the movements weren't as good as Yoroichi's, it was still enough to put the Demon King in his place. Kokoshibo had secretly been trying to learn the Hinokami Kagura, and all the nights he spent working on it paid off. He had to use moon breathing, but if he could just copy the lesser techniques of the Hinokami Kagura, he could have a watered-down version of sun breathing, and it was effective. Whilst Muzan was pinned down, Kokoshibo turned around as he looked at Nezuko and Rokuta. Run! He would scream as they did exactly that. But before they could get out of the house, Muzan retaliated. He activated all the Muzan cells in Kokoshibo's body, which made him become a lot weaker. In that instant, he would throw Kokoshibo aside, and before Nezuko and Rokuta could step a foot outside, they both got pierced by an attack. Quite interesting, Gokoshibo. I will severely punish you for this, but you've become an even more valuable asset, so I'll let your oldest daughter live. He would say this while pouring his blood over Nezuko. Now where is Tanjiro? Muzan would say with a cold tone. Kokoshibo, however, got up. Even though all the Muzan cells in his body were destroying him, he stood up as he got in a stance. His eyes remind Muzan of that man. Yoroichi. Even though he has Kokoshibo pinned down by his cells, he still shows this much willpower. As Kokoshibo blitzes Muzan and they have a fight, destroying most of the forest before Muzan ends up using his cells to knock Kokoshibo out, as they enter the Infinity Castle. Muzan tells the Biwa Demon that they will have an upper moon meeting. Meanwhile, Tanjiro is waking up. It's early in the morning, and he wants to start going up the mountain as fast as he can. When he exits out of the house of the Elder, however, he can smell blood, and instantly he knows that it's from his family's home. He takes a breath and blitzes up the mountain. In less than 40 seconds, he arrives at his home. He sees Nezuko and Rokuta laying outside. When he looks inside, he sees the rest of his family slaughtered. At the entrance of the home, a pool of blood can be seen as he can tell that it's his father's. However, another very strong scent can be picked up. It's the scent he always picked up from his father, but stronger and more vile and putrid than he had ever smelled. 
Looking over, he sees that his sister's still breathing. She's the only one still alive, so he grabs her and is about to make his descent. However, he notices that a massive area of the forest has been destroyed, and quickly running over with his sister, he can smell his father's scent all around him. However, the man is nowhere to be spotted. Father, I hope you're alright. Tondra would say as he started running down the mountain. All of a sudden, his sister would start squirming around on his back as they both fell down the side of the mountain. However, Tondra would save them by sticking the landing. His sister, seeing how he saved her, wakes up. Tanjiro, what happened? She would say as she stood up after he had set her down. I don't know. When I returned home, everyone was dead and our father was missing. He would say as tears started to swell up. Nazuko, who was now taller than Tanjiro, had grown in size as she also had claws and teeth. What's happening to me? I can hear this voice, although it's very distant. It's kind of annoying, she would say as he was looking at her hands. She had somehow been able to resist Muzan's control, and she still had grown stronger from his blood. Tanjiro could smell that the scent on her, although it wasn't very strong, and it felt like it was fading away. All of a sudden, a sword would come rushing at Nezuko. Tanjiro, however, deflected it. Looking over, there was a blue-haired man standing there with a sword raised at Nezuko. Why are you protecting that demon? The man would ask with a confused look on his face. She's not a demon, she's my sister. And who are you anyway? Tantra would say and ask, infuriated that somebody tried to strike at his sister. My name is Gyu Tomioka. I work for the Demon Slayer Corpse as you do, too. He said confident in his statement, although his crow would descend on his shoulder and speak. That boy is not part of the Demon Slayer Corps, which surprised Gyu. But he has a Nitrin blade, he would say as he pointed at Tandra's katana. This sword was a gift from my father. Tantra would say as he got in a stance. Gyu looked at his stance and confirmed that it wasn't any of the breathing style stances he had seen before. Anyway, kid, your sister's a demon, and she will have to die. I'm sorry, Gyu would say as he rushed at Nezuko. She's my last sibling. I won't let you harm her. Tantra would say as he took a breath. Moon breathing, third form. Loadsome moon chains. Tanjiro would say as he created two giant slashes which quickly changed into many smaller slashes. Gyu quickly had to defend against all of the slashes as he backed off. Although he seemed fine at first, after backing off his wounds opened, as tiny cuts all over his body formed. I couldn't even react to these attacks. Gyu would be surprised by Tanjiro's strength. Before he could speak, however, Nezuko would butt in. Will you two cut it out already? She said as she stopped them from fighting further. Look what you've done now, Tanjiro. What did father say about hurting people that haven't done anything to you? She would say whilst looking at Tanjiro disappointedly, as he himself got a bit embarrassed. Nezuko walked over to Gyu, who put up his guard. As she simply touched him, he erupted into flames. They didn't hurt, and they actually healed him for a bit. I hope that's better. She would say as she then patted Gyu. Although you are a demon, you show no interest in consuming blood. Hey kid, Kiyu would say whilst looking over at Tanjiro. The breathing style you just used doesn't exist from what I know. You should become a demon slayer and help us fight against the person that killed your family. Kiyu would say as he then proceeded to say to Tanjiro that he should head to Sekonji Orokodaki, who lives on Sagiri Mountain. The sun would then pierce through the cloud for a second as they would touch Nezuko. However, she was fine, showing that she, unlike other demons, could walk around in the sun. Gi would leave and Tandro would follow his advice as he set out to Mount Sagiri after he buried his family. Passing by a shrine, Tandro found a demon, although he quickly defeated the demon and buried the monks that lived there. Are you Tanjiro Kamado? A voice would say, turning around Tanjiro saw an older looking man who wore a red Tengu mask. Yes, that's me. Are you Sekonji Rokodaki? He would ask. Yes, I see that you disposed of that demon. Good work, he would say as he patted Tanjiro on the head. Now follow me, the old man would say as he started the run. At first, the old man thought Tanjiro wasn't following because he couldn't hear footsteps coming from behind him. But as he turned back, he saw that both Tanjiro and Nezuko were easily keeping up. 
They arrived at his house where they both had to take a test. They climbed up the mountain and when they reached the top, Rokodaki would say, Reach the bottom of the mountain before morning and I will take you as my students, as he disappeared. Shortly after, Tanjiro would also disappear. As Rokodaki got to the bottom of the mountain, he saw Tanjiro sitting there, waiting patiently. You are quite fast for an older person, Tanjiro would say with a smirk. Rokodaki was thoroughly impressed by Tanjiro already, as they talked for about 30 minutes, after which Nezuko arrived at the bottom. You both are outstanding in your own rights, he would say as he patted them both on the head. Your training starts tomorrow. The next day, they both started their training. Nezuko would get taught the basics, and Tanjiro was getting taught how to use water breathing, and the basics of breathing styles. Weeks flew by, and Tanjiro had already learned all of the water breathing forms and how to use breathing. Although, Nezuko was struggling a bit more than he was. She was still learning fast. Tanjiro would get his rock to slice, and would be able to slice it after 6 months. He didn't take the final selection exam because he wanted to wait for his sister, so he has decided to train his moon breathing. It took Nezuko a little over a year and a half to finally cut her rock. She had a lot more struggle due to her being a demon, but she got the gist of it pretty fast. The only reason that Tanjiro actually took six months to slash his rock was because he was simply too lazy to actually bother. Instead, he just more enjoyed watching Nezuko train, or helping her out. In this time, Tanjiro had perfected his moon breathing, water breathing, and he had actually learned that Hinokami Kagura was a breathing style as well, which he mastered pretty fast as well. Due to him having an inhumane physical body, he could easily keep up with the moves and use them however he wanted. And, as well as his father being a genius among geniuses in breathing styles, he already knew most of it from training with his father in the past, so he could easily overpower anybody in terms of learning speed or in terms of teaching as well. Fact was that Orokodaki actually took a few notes that Tanjiro had given him, and he had sent them to the Demon Slayer HQ. Notes that would help Demon Slayers easily grasp breathing better, and would basically just increase their ranks more and more, because it would make the training easier. They took the test together after, and although they had to pass through Wisteria, Nezuko seemed fine. The twins were made aware of the fact that she was a demon, but they had gotten special permission for her to become part of the Demon Slayer Corp. After all, Gyu had explained to Byashiki what he had seen, and that Tanjiro was stronger than him even without a perfected breathing technique. Tanjiro's aura alone would scare other participants, but some of them were quite intrigued by him. Now Nezuko had gotten a katana from Orokodaki, but Tanjiro still used his own, although the both had different masks, with Tanjiro's being a black mask with one eye having a moon-like circle and the other having a sun-like circle. The exam began and Tanjiro had a really easy time. No demon really stood a chance against him and since his sister seemed fine, he didn't really care about the entire questioning them for a cure. Nezuko had a simple time as well, but she came across a demon monstrosity that was about to kill a person, although she saved him and deflected the demon's attacks. The demon made a remark about the mask she wore and laughed about Sabito and Makomo's deaths. Nezuko had actually become friends with them as they helped her master water breathing, so she was pissed and in an instant she decapitated the demon. She still showed remorse to the demon, but then she continued on. The week had quickly passed and Tanjiro had survived easily. He actually killed 90% of the demons on the mountain, the other 10 being done by other participants. They got greeted by the twins who complimented them on their perf performance. This time, 9 slayers survived with some weaker slayers surviving thanks to Tanjiro and Nezuko. They got fitted for their demon slayer costumes, but one participant got impatient as he pulled on the, the twins' hair. Tandro seeing this stepped in as he spoke. Take your hand off her or I'll break your arm. As if you could, the man would say, but Tandro would proceed to break his arm, which hurt the man a lot. Afterwards, they got brought to the ore selection as they got to choose which ore they wanted to use for their Nitran sword. Tandro took a sniff as he chose his. He said that his father's Nitran should be remelted and used in conjunction with this with his ore. Although the twins were hesitant at first, they allowed it, since Tanjiro's sword looked to be quite strong. 
The other participants and Nezuko chose their oar, and afterwards they left to go home. They arrived, which made Orokodaki happy as he shed tears. At Orokodaki's house, Nezuko and Tanjiro would be sharing a meal, as they were both waiting for their Nitrin blades. Whilst they waited, Nezuko would continue training a bit, and Tanjiro would be helping Orokodaki out. Their swordsmith would arrive as he would first reveal Nezuko's blade, which has a red wood handle with black cord wrap, and a nice black wheel guard. When she grabbed the blade and took it out of the sheath, she would hold it up, as the blade started changing color as it turned black. The swordsmith looked a bit disappointed, but he then revealed Tanjiro's blade, which kept his father's sheath, but it was slightly different for all the rest. Its handle was golden red, with a, red, with a black to white cord wrap. As he unsheathed his blade, he could feel the work that the swordsmith had put into the blade. As he held it up, the blade started to change color, but before it did, it got a pattern. The left side of the blade had a sun pattern, and the right side had a moon pattern on the back of the blade. As the edge turned red, the swordsmith was excited to see the red sword, as he almost cried from excitement. I knew you would have a red sword, the smith would say, pointing at Tanjiro. What do you mean? Tanjiro would ask, a bit confused. Well, you're a child of fire after all, so is your sister, but I guess her fate is sealed, the smith would say, shruggingly. What do you mean by her fate is sealed? Tanjiro would ask with a confused expression. But Orokodaki would butt in and explain that there is little known about people that have black swords. Shortly after, the blacksmith left happy about what he saw. And the crow would announce their first mission, to go to a certain village where women had been going missing. By Nezuko's request, the two hurried over there at high speed, arriving a day earlier than what your average slayer would have been able to do. As they arrived in the day, they went around asking for the disappearances. But they came up with nothing, and decided to just patrol at night, which they did. They split up to cover more ground, and eventually Tanjiro ran into a couple, as he trailed them without them noticing him. As he took a sniff, he could smell the demon close by, as it was about to kidnap the girl. But Tanjiro would decapitate it before it even got close. The girl and the boy were both shocked at what they saw, and had just took a step back, as two more demons showed themselves. As they started gritting their teeth together at the sight of their other part getting decapitated. It will be alright, I will protect you both, Tanjiro would say with a firm look in his eyes. Meanwhile, Nezuko would show up as she saw them fighting, as she prepared to join in. As she took one of the demons and started fighting it separately. Although the demon was fast, she would easily dodge all of its attacks, and when she had an opening, she would decapitate the demon without any issues at all, using the first form of water breathing. Tanjiro had already finished his other demon off without any problems at all. After all, his strength was on par with that of a legendary swordsman. He'd help the girl and her fiancé out as he guided them home, as the boy thanked Tanjiro for saving them. The girl's parents, hearing about what had happened, offered Tanjiro and his sister to stay for the night, which they accepted. The next morning, the two would set out for their next mission, as they headed to Tokyo, where they stopped at an udon shop to eat some udon. But as they got their bulbs, they both smelled a familiar scent. As Nezuko started freaking out, Tanjiro got up, leaving his udon bowl as he started running to the smell at full speed. As he was jumping from rooftop to rooftop to arrive there even faster, landing right behind the source of the smell. As the man turned around to be met by Tanjiro's raging eyes, as he had his hand on his sword, preparing to strike at the man, but then he saw the kid the man was holding, and for a second Tanjiro's mind took a dark turn, but he snapped out of it. The man looked at Tanjiro confused until he noticed his scar and earrings, as he whispered, Tanjiro. His suspicion got confirmed when Nezuko caught up and looked at the man with a hateful stare. Where is my father? Tanjiro would ask with a hate-filled stare. He is getting punished for his betrayal, Muzan whispered, which only four people heard. Tanjiro was angry, but he kept his composure. Muzan, however, would grow his claws as he prepared to slash at a bystander. However, his slash got deflected by Tanjiro, which shocked Muzan. 
speed faster than he could comprehend, as he lost his composure for a second, although he'd used one of his powers to create a fire close to them, as he then proceeded to walk away whilst Nezuko and Tantro were preoccupied. Seeing this, a kind voice, voice spoke out to Tantro. That was very brave of you, young man, a lady would say as she invited them over to her house. They followed her. She was a demon, but she was kind. As she explained that she is a demon outside of Muzan's control, just like Nezuko, who wants to defeat him just as much as the demon slayers want to. As she explains that she's searching for a cure, but she needs more of Muzan's blood to complete her cure. Tandro explained that his father is apparently an Upper Moon Demon, and that he is Upper Moon One, which she's quite surprised with. As she grabs blood from both Tandro, who is the eldest son of the strongest of all the siblings, and she gets a bit of blood from Nezuko, who was turned into a demon but resisted the Muzan cells. This will help a lot. Thank you, Tamayo would say, but at that moment Tandro would grab his sister and them and move to another room, as they, the room they were in before it got completely destroyed. Standing there was Lower Moon 2 and two other demons. Tandro and Nezuko would walk outside to fight these demons. I'll take care of the Lower Moon. Tandro would say preparing to go into a stance. Alright, I'll take the two other demons, Nezuko would say as she took a breath. You're quite brave coming at me by yourself, the demon would say, but before it could gloat more, Tandro would already have cut off its arm. Quite pathetic, really, Tandro would say as he kicked the demon down as he took a breath. Moon breathing. Twelfth form. Half moon cry. He'd say as he proceeded to move his sword down in one powerful motion, slashing the demon's head clean off. As Tamyo came outside and grabbed some of his blood for research. Meanwhile, Nezuko was fighting the other two demons, and she was doing pretty good. She took another breath as her blade lit on fire. As it turned red, she would take another breath. Water breathing, fourth form improved. Exploding striking tide. As she would hit both demons' necks, as the fire on her blade made it easy to cut through their necks, which after they were cut, small explosions would go off. Tamiya would once again grab their blood for research. The crow would ask for a report and Tanjiro would give his report, after which they got their next mission as they set out after stopping by the udon shop to get some more udon. Afterwards they set out. On their way they came across a boy with yellow hair who was trying to force a girl to marry him. After Tanjiro had helped the girl out and dragged the boy along, they continued on to where their mission was. The boy had severely calmed down because of Nezuko's presence. After all, she was pretty and he had fallen in love with her on the spot. They figured out that his name was Zenitsu, as they all had to go to the same mission. Arriving at a house in the middle of the woods, the three would be met by two kids, who looked at them in fear. Are you kids alright? Nezuko would ask with a smile, which put them at ease. Our older brother, he got taken by a monster. One of the kids would say, trembling. Don't worry, we'll save your older brother, Tanjiro would say, preparing to go inside the house. Nezuko would follow shortly after, as Zenitsu would follow, not wanting Nezuko to get hurt. They all got split up, however, because of the demon's blood demon art, which left Tanjiro in a hallway, right next to a demon, as somebody was screaming, Coming through! And as Tanjiro looked over, he saw a boy wearing a boar mask running at them at full speed, as he decapitated the demon. Ha ha ha, I'm the best, he would scream whilst flexing his muscles. Tanjiro would look confused, but the boy would just look at him worried. Did you hit your head? Tanjiro would be worried that the boy might have hit his head too hard. The boy, oblivious to what Tanjiro meant, would simply reply no, as he started running off again. Tantro followed behind, although the boy didn't notice. They would stumble upon Zenitsu, who was with the older brother, as he was fighting a demon, although he was asleep. He easily dispatched the demon. Meanwhile, Nezuko was fighting the drum demon, who she beat after a little while. All meeting up outside, the siblings would hug their brother as they proceeded to the part, with Tantro and Nezuko making grace for the deceased. Inosuke, the boy who was wearing the mask would want to fight Nezuko, as he knew she was partly a demon, although she declined with a smile, which calmed him down. Tantra would eventually have to calm him down with a headbutt, though. 
which made Inosuke realize that he's insanely strong. Their next orders were to go to rest at a nearby Wisteria Mansion, where they went. They get there after half a day of walking as they get greeted by an elderly woman. The woman gives them food and a place to sleep, which Inosuke admires. Nezuka and Zenitsu get to know each other better in this time, and they become good friends. Tanjiro, however, keeps to himself, as he is conflicted on what he should have done in Tokyo. Should he have attacked Muzan there and end it all, or did he do the right thing? Although he had no idea and decided to sleep on it, as they spent two days there and they got to their next mission, which was to go help out at Natagomo Mountain, which they arrived at the, after a day of running. Arriving at Natugomo Mountain, the four of them would look up at the mountain. Without saying much, Tanjiro started walking towards the mountain. Let's go, he would say as a determined look came over his face, with Nezuko and Inosuke following him. Hold on, we shouldn't be rushing into this, Sinitsu would say, scared to go into the mountain. There might be people dying. If we don't go now, that number will only go up, Tanjiro would say, ignoring his companion's words and continuing up the mountain. Zenitsu would follow suit as well, after thinking about it for a minute, and he didn't want Nezuko to get hurt. Although, he gets lost and can't find his way back to the party. Tanjiro, Nezuko, and Inosuke find other demon slayers, one of which is named Marata, after which they find even more demon slayers, however this time they find demon slayers that are alive, and some that are just basically walking corpses. Tanjiro would look at this sight with an angry look as he destroyed the webs holding the slayers. Inosuke would follow this up by using his seventh form, Spatial Awareness. Whilst he used it, a massive headless body would appear. Nezuko will defeat the demon and we will hold this body off, Tanjiro would say getting in a stance. Right, the other two would say, both doing their parts respectfully with Nezuko rushing at the mother spider which was controlling the bodies, as Inosuke followed Tanjiro's example. With Tanjiro taking this as a rather easy challenge, he'd deflect the attacks and eventually Inosuke would chop at the corpse's nape as it disintegrated. Nezuko would decapitate the mother spider as she used the fifth form of water breathing, as she saw that the demon surrendered, so she gave her a painless death. As she quickly grouped back up with Tanjiro and Inosuke, Marada would help the injured slayers down the mountain, which Tanjiro thanked him for. Meanwhile, Zenitsu would come face to face with the brother's demon, as he got injected by the demon's poison. However, through sheer willpower and the thought of Nezuko, he used his thunder breathing, thunderclap and flash, sixfold, to defeat the demon. Although this left him in a pretty bad state, as he had to use breathing to stop the poison from spreading. Tanjiro, Nezuko, and Inosuke would also find their next foe, although they escaped and in their stead the father demon would arrive. As Nezuko got launched away, which made Tanjiro worry although he had to take this demon down first. Together with Inosuke, the two would rush at the demon. As Tanjiro slashed at its arms, however, the demon's skin was too tough for Inosuke to cut, and he got hit in the stomach pretty badly. He got up, however, and the now-transformed father demon would have to face his wrath. As he pinned down the demon's arms, Tanjiro came in and finished off the demon with a clean slash to its neck, decapitating the demon. Inosuke, are you alright? Tanjiro would say, running towards his companion. I'm fine. You go to your sister, alright? I don't need your help, Kampachiro, he would say with a confident look. And although Tanjiro knew that his body was pretty injured, he'd continue on. Shortly after, Inosuke would sit down against a tree, impressed by Tanjiro's strength. Tanjiro would catch up to his sister using her smell as a tracking method. When he arrived, however, he saw her badly injured, finding what looked to be a child. Although when the child looked over at Tanjiro, it would reveal that he is Lower Moon 5 of the 12th Kizuki. Tanjiro was angry at this boy for harming his sister. You'll pay for harming my sister, Tanjiro would say as he took a breath. Siblings, I see. This kind of fluff for one sister. I'd love to have it too. So how about I take your sister for myself? Rui would say, which scared his sister. She, however, got told to leave by Rui. However, Rui got the face of a dumbfounded Tanjiro. You can't just take somebody hostage and call that sibling love. Tanjiro would say as he got into a moon breath stance. Hold on a minute. Your stance... Are you perhaps a user of moon breathing? 
Rui would say as he tied Nezuko to a tree with his webs. Tanjiro would smirk. My father's name is Michikatsu Tsujikuni. Although you might know him as Kokoshibo, Tanjiro would say shortly after rushing at Rui, who was now scared for his life as he tried running away. However, Nezuko would burn the strings that he had tied her with as she took a breath and used her blood to make her blade red. He was now pinned between the two as he had no choice. He had to fight. As he used his red strings to form a cage around him, which Nezuko striked and burned, Tanjiro would also just slash them as he took another breath and changed his form. In an instant, he was in front of Rui as he spoke. Hino Kamikagura. Dance, as he slashed vertically with such tremendous force and speed that Rui couldn't even comprehend that he had been decapitated as he started disintegrating. Tanjiro would then help his sister who was still regenerating her wounds, although he'd place his hands on Rui's back to show his sympathy. As Giyu came walking in with a sleeping Inosuke on his back, I assume that you took care of the demons, he'd say looking at Tanjiro with his usual sad expression. There is one more demon remaining, although they shouldn't be that strong, Tanjiro would say with a firm expression. Nezuko, however, would get up and hug Gyu, much to his surprise. They had heard a lot about Gyu from Orokodaki, or at least Nezuko had heard a lot, and she felt really sad for him. Gyu didn't know why, but it brought tears to his eyes as he thanked her. In return, she just smiled, which warmed his heart. Although in that instant, a blade would be swung at Nezuko. Gyu would be caught off guard, but Tanjiro intercepted the blade, as he actually pinned down the person who had slashed at Nezuko before they even noticed that they were pinned down. Shinobu, Gyu would say. You know this woman? Tanjiro would say as he had, ev as he had even disarmed her. Yes, she's a fellow pillar. Also, that was quite impressive, Gyu would say. Tanjiro had just blitzed one of the fastest pillars, as if it was nothing. Um, could you let go of me now? Shinobu would say with a confused expression. No, Tanjiro would say, still holding her down. His aura was frightening for everybody around him, until a girl who was around the same age as him tugged on his haori. Please let go of her, she would whisper, frightened of Tanjiro. Brother, let her go, come on, Nezuko would say, flicking him on the forehead as he let her go. He was still holding her blade, however, as he returned it shortly after. Shinobu finally got to look at the face of the boy, and she was struck. After all, Tanjiro was quite the handsome man, his aura boosting the feeling of confidence and strength. Why'd you swing at my sister? he'd ask. Shinobu, struggling to find an answer, just said, Because she's a demon, although she was unsure of it at this point. The girl who had... Teary eyes was now holding Shinobu by her Aori, glad that she was still alive, as she just got patted by the Hashira. Tanjiro would just point at the Demon Slayer uniform Nezuko was wearing, which confused Shinobu even more. However, a crow would come and tell them that Nezuko and Tanjiro were to be brought back to the Demon Slayer HQ. Have all the demons been dispatched off? Kyu would ask Shinobu, who was surprised by the former's sudden question. Tanjiro butting in would confirm. They have all been dispatched off, he said with a confident smile. I don't smell a single demon on this mountain, he'd say whilst he was helping Inosuke. Most of the harmed demon slayers were helped by the Kakushi, which helped them by carrying them down the mountain for first aid and all that. As Tanjiro followed both Giyu and Shinobu back to the HQ of the demon slayer corps, where they were to hold a Hashira meeting. Shinobu, Giyu, Tantra, and Nezuko would be talking with each other on the way to the HQ, as Nezuko and Shinobu got really close really quickly, with her being so kind to Shinobu. Shinobu would remark that this is the most she had heard Giyu talk with him, being in such a keep-to-himself type person. Arriving at Ubiashiki's mansion, they'd still be talking, with the other Hashras arriving some of the Hashras were shocked because of the amount of talking Giyu did, although they found it quite pleasant. Mitsuri would arrive and, as usual, be pretty loud. She'd look around and see Tanjiro as she blushed because he smiled at her. He was handsome and had a strong aura around him, and she became quite silent after that. Pretty much everybody was quiet, with the only ones having a light-hearted conversation being Tanjiro, Nezuko, Giyu, and Shinobu. 
well until Sonami walked in, as he instantly started yelling at Tanjiro and Nezuko, although this was cut off when Ubiashiki walked in, as all the Hashira bowed with Nezuko and Sanjiro still standing, which the other Hashira disliked, as the snake Hashira Obanai tried to force them to kneel, although he got told to stop by Ubiashiki. Stand, Ubiashiki would say, and the Hashira would precisely do that. Tantro Nesuko, if you would please come forth, he'd say with a calm and soothing voice, which the two did. Now, as most of you know, Nesuko has been turned into a demon, although she resisted the cells. Now, this might confuse some of you, Ubiashiki would say as he took a moment to think of the right words to say. She can still use her demon blood art, and her healing is indeed that of a demon. Although she can still walk around in the sun, and wisteria isn't poisonous to her, at least the normal lethal amount would not be poisonous, Ubiashiki would say. This is because of her human side and probably because of her heritage. Now this in itself is fine. She has learned a breathing style and has even devoted herself to become part of the Demon Slayer Corpse. And for that I am truly grateful. Ubiashiki would say, giving a short bow. Nezuko is an official member of the Demon Slayer Corpse, as she hasn't attacked any human, and has actually shown great care for the human slayers among her. Sanami would hear this and protest, asking if he would be allowed to perform a test, which Ubiashiki accepted. As Nezuko walked towards Sanami, he'd cut himself, revealing his mariachi blood. Nezuko, however, would approach him, as she put her hand on his wound. See, I told you a demon is a demon, however, before he could finish his sentence, his wound would light on fire, as it got healed. Slightly. As he looked at Nezuko, she would pull his cheek. Don't harm yourself. You should take care of your body, she'd say with a light smile. Sonami didn't say anything as he just backed off and got back in line, as she just turned around and walked back to her brother. However, Tantra was just looking at Ubiashiki, as he looked over at Nezuko and pointed lightly to the man. She nodded as she walked up to Ubiashiki. The other demon slayers all looked at her whilst questioning what she was about to do. As Tantra turned around, he'd look at them all with a smile. At that moment, Ubiashiki would catch on fire much to the horror of the Hashra, who all got into a stance. However, Tanjiro would raise his hand with a smile. The curse mark on Ubiashiki's face slowly started to retract from the left back to the right, as most of the mark returned to the right side of his face. As Nezuko was breathing heavily from trying to cure him, she'd eventually pass out, with Tanjiro catching her. I guess she can't cure you completely. At least this should hurt less than before, Tanjiro would say with a smile. As he looked back at Ubiashiki, who now only had a mark around his right eye, the man now being able to see again smiled. Thank you, truly. Itseya's stare started welling up. The other Hashira stunned, all bowed to Tanjiro who was holding Nezuko. However, the boy was slowly walking to Shinobu. Could you take care of my sister, please? Of course, Shinobu would say as she snapped her fingers as two Kakushi came in and took Nezuko. As Tanjiro walked back to where he was standing before. How about you tell them the rest, Tanjiro would say looking at Ubiashiki. You already knew, didn't you? Ubiashiki would say as he, grained, as he regained the firm look on his face. Yeah, Tanjiro would say, saddened. What do you mean, master? Kokoshiba would say with a massive smile, happy to see Ubiashiki in better health. Tanjiro, would you please tell us your last name? Without much more, Tanjiro would speak. My name is Tanjiro Tsujikuni. He'd say which only put one person in real shock, which was Muichiro. Most of the history of the Demon Slayers were lost because they had come to the brink of extinction many times throughout history. But many names, like the Tsujikuni name, the Mark and all that, was still in their books. So the Demon Slayers kind of knew who Tanjiro was, but they didn't really realize right away what it meant. Besides Muichiro, who was actually told that he was related to this cursed name. Tanjiro is the son of an upper rank demon, specifically upper rank 1, Ubiashiki would say keeping his composure. Some of the Hashras were uneasy until Sanami spoke up. Sir, knowing this, you know that we can't have mercy on him, he'd say with an angered look. Ubiashiki was about to speak, but he got cut off by Tanjiro. 
Look, I don't really care about your Demon Slayer corpse. Sure, I'll help out if you need my help, but in truth, I'm only using the corpse to complete my goal, which is simply to save my father and destroy Kibutsuji Muson. Tanjiro would say releasing an aura that scared even the other Hashira. Muichiro, however, would be enraged, unlike his usual self, which scared the other Hashira. Why would you want to rescue that traitor? He'd say, pointing at Tanjiro, as Tanjiro turned to the boy. Ubiyashiki would speak. Muichiro, I know how you feel, but Muichiro would cut off Ubiyashiki as he'd continue slandering Tanjiro's father. He deserves nothing but death, the boy would say as he was about to continue, but in an instant he got kicked by Tanjiro, which none of the Hashiro were able to see, as Muichiro was kicked into the outside wall of the mansion. If you dare badmouth my father one more time, I won't have mercy, Tanjiro would say as he gave a death stare to the boy. How dare you, Sanami and Gyomei would say as they both rushed at Tanjiro with their weapons drawn, although he'd easily move faster than both of them, knocking them to the ground. I used to work as a mercenary. I've taken human lives before as well. Does that make me a demon? Tanjiro would say with a cold tone. Rengoku would get up as he draws his weapon. Tanjiro ever just looked at him with a death stare. Enough! Ubiyashiku would say as everybody came to a standstill, as he'd walk up to Tanjiro. He bowed and he would speak. I did not wish for your father to be disrespected. I apologize in the Hashira stead. We require your help in beating Muzan. That much is obvious to anyone. If you would please help us. He'd say as he bowed down to Tanjiro. I'll help. Tanjiro would say as he kneeled down, extending his hand to Ubiyashiki, he'd help him back up. I'm sorry for hurting your Hashira. He'd say as he realized what he had done. Gyome and Sanami got up, as Tanjiro bowed to them. I'm sorry, he'd say with a sorrowful expression. Gyome would cry at Tanjiro's sincerity, as he accepted the apology. Sanami would just say, whatever. Muichiro would get up as he walked up to Tanjiro and bowed. I'm sorry, I lost my cool as he proceeded to bow to Ubiyashiki as well, who told him it was fine. A Kakoshi would treat Muichiro as they continued the meeting. They talked about everything Tanjiro knew and the Hashira talked about everything they knew. Ubiyashiki would be quite delighted at all the useful information they had gained as he called the meeting adjourned. All the Hashira were preparing to leave, however, they got stopped. Hold on, Tanjiro would say, getting the attention from everyone. When I was seven or eight years old, my father compared me to a Hashira. Now, I'm certain he meant a Hashira on the level of Gyome or Sonami, or maybe even above. Now, I'll just help you all out a bit. If you're in a dire situation or in a pinch, remember, grip your blade with all your strength, and you'll manage to survive. He'd say as he left with Shinobu, arriving at her ni mansion by nightfall. As he was allowed to stay there, he went to bed and slept like a newborn baby. As he woke up, he was called. Tanjiro would get called as he went over to he found Shinobu and Kanoe. They were casually having a cup of tea whilst Tanjiro walked in. Shinobu poured him a cup of tea as she spoke. Will you be partaking in the rehabilitation training? She would say with a smile. Tanjiro would be confused as he spoke up. Why would you want me to do that? He'd say with a confused look on his face. Well, because you might learn a thing or two, Shinobu said with a smile as she stood up preparing to leave. She would leave as Kanoe and Tanjiro just sat there quietly until Inosuke barged in prepared to train. They started his training as Tanjiro just proceeded to observe. He'd realized the trick Kanoe was using, simply using her breathing constantly. He'd proceed to do the same pretty easily, getting used to it pretty quickly. He hadn't realized it, but his father had actually been training him to do this since well, since the start of their training. As he proceeded to train how she trained it for a few weeks, as he also taught Nezuko, Inosuke, and Zenitsu how to do it. He didn't need to train it how she did, but he just felt like he should go through the process of what the modern day slayers did, as his father's training might be outdated. Tanjiro easily broke the gourd that Kanoe broke without a sweat. He'd actually be using Hinokami Kagura to increase his stamina, as using water breathing didn't really do anything. He also needed to get used to the fevers that using Hinokami Kagura brought, but he'd easily get used to this. The Kasugai Crow would fly in and give them their next assignment, which was to assist the Flame Hashira Kyojuro Rengoku. They'd depart and arrive at a train station as they boarded to train. 
Moving from wagon to wagon, they'd eventually found a yellow-haired man eating, as he kept repeating the same thing. Umai! 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 Tantra and the others approached the man. Tantra would say, we meet again. The man got up after finishing his food. As he looked at Tantra for a moment, his expression changing that to that of distrust, but after seeing the boy's eyes, he just extended his hand. It will be a pleasure working with you, Rengoku would say with a smile. Likewise, Tandro would say, shaking his hand. They'd sit down and all of them would have a conversation. Tandro would ask Rengoku about the Hinokami Kagura, with Rengoku simply replying that he doesn't know anything about it. Rengoku would bring up the probability of Tandro being from an old demon-slaying family, and Tandro denies this because he inherited the dance from his grandfather, and in their family they've only had charcoal burners running through his mother's side of the family. Rengoku would want to speak, but he would be cut off by the train conductor, as they needed to get their train tickets punched. Although they'd fall asleep because of the blood demon art of the demon who's controlling the conductors. Tandro would be inside the mountains where his family lived. He'd look around as he noticed the nice weather before being met by his father. Father, how are you here? Tandro would ask, confused. What do you mean, Tandro? We're training, Kokoshiba would say as he got into a stance. That's right, I'm learning from my father right now, the boy would say as he went into a kind of trance. All of the demon slayers would be asleep, and would have their certain dreams as kids proceeded to tie ropes to their wrists, and to the wrists of the demon slayers. They would enter the dreams of the demon slayers. Tandro would be fighting his father, as his body still remembered the hours of training he had done in the future. As Tandro took a breath, he would fall into an even deeper trance. Hinokami Kagura. Flame Dance. He'd say as he instantly flew towards his father, the latter dodging the first strike being shocked at Tanjiro's sudden burst of strength. The second strike would come in and Kokoshiba would block it. Alright, that's enough for today, he'd say as Tanjiro snapped out of his trance. Quite impressive, where did you learn that sword form? Kokoshiba would ask, his voice trembling slightly. Uh, sorry, I don't know. I don't remember what I just did, the boy would say with a light smile. Well then, let's freshen up before we go back home, Kokoshibo would say as they made their way to a nearby river. Arriving at the river, Tanjiro looked down, as he saw his and his father's reflection. One was him, but with his uniform on. The other was his father, although he had four more eyes. Wake up, both reflections would say as Tanjiro snapped out of it. As he quickly stood up. What's wrong, son? Kokoshibo would say with a surprised expression. I'm sorry, father. But this is a dream, Tanjiro would say as he looked around for a way out. Hold on, Tanjiro, where are you going? His father would say as Tanjiro was walking away. The boy would turn around as he looked at his father with sad eyes. I know that you're a demon father, but honestly, I don't care. You're still my father, and I love you no matter what the others say. So leave everything to me, Tanjiro would say. Although Kukushibo didn't say anything and just smiled. Meanwhile, in Tanjiro's subconscious, the boy with tuberculosis would be looking for his soul, as the little fragments of fire led him to Tanjiro's soul. But the boy just collapsed on himself, saying that Tanjiro's soul was too beautiful. Tanjiro would shortly after wake up by cutting himself, as he assessed the situation. He first made sure that Nezuko was alright, but shortly after, she'd wake up. She'd burn the robes binding everyone. Well, 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 looks like you woke up. A harsh voice would say. As Tanjiro looked over, he saw three demons standing there. Lower Moon 6, 4, and 3. We have come here to make you an offer, Tanjiro Tsujikuni. Join us and become a demon. Then your father will be abstained from his sins. Lower Moon 6 would say with a crooked smile. Scum, that's all I have to say to you. I'll save my father with my own hands. I won't become a demon that harms people. Tanjiro would say as he drew his sword. Nezuko, keep the people asleep safe. Tanjiro would say as he blitzed towards the demons. He started fighting the three lower moons. Each time he'd get close to cutting one of their necks, they'd deflect the blow or counterattack together. They're a lot stronger than the lower moon too that I've beaten before, Tanjiro would think to himself. I see. You got more of that man's blood, didn't you? Tanjiro would say as he took a breath. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Moon breathing, first form. 
Dark Moon Evening Palace. It says he slashed in a horizontal motion, releasing a lot of chaotic little slashes that would severely injure the demons. They would retreat in, retreat in an instant using one of the demons' blood demon art. Cowards, Tundra would say with a cold tone. As he turned around, the other slayers would wake up. Inosuke and Nezuko, I can smell another demon scent. Actually, it's all over the train, so I think the train might be a demon. I need you two to take care of this demon. Rengoku Zenitsu, you should both protect the passengers. I'll take of the lower. I'll take care of the lower moons. Tanjiro would say as he left. The others would all do their part, and Tanjiro would be fighting the lower moons. Every time they got severely injured, they'd just run away, and Tanjiro would have no choice to do this kind of cat and mouse game. Until the train crashed, and he jumped to safety. As he stood, he'd see four demons in front of him. I'm sorry, Tanjiro. I couldn't cut his neck. Nezuko would scream from the other side of the train. Finally, the smoke settled and Tanjiro got to look at their faces. Four lower moons, eh? Fine, come at me. Tanjiro would say as he took a breath. All four of the lower moons ran at him, with lower moon one now being there as well. He unfused from the train, Tanjiro would think, as the demon was quite a bit stronger now. Meanwhile, Tanjiro could hear fighting on the other side of the train. That must be our backup, and Mu would say with a smirk, which put Tanjiro off. Hinokami Kagura. Dragon Sun Halo Head Dance, Tanjiro would say with a hesitation, instantly closing the gap between him and the other demons. But before he could get a hit on them, he would be put asleep, as he used his trick to wake up again. This would be a continuous thing until right before Tanjiro would have cut off Enmu's head, he'd put him to sleep, this time giving Tanjiro a nightmare. You are a pathetic son. You should just roll over and die, a voice would say. Tanjiro would turn to see a battered and beaten Kokoshibo. Father, the boy would say, not being able to find the words to speak. Lu, you left your family to die, and you haven't even been able to save me. You are a disappointment, Kokoshibo would say disappointingly. Instead of being sad, Tanjiro would just clench his fist as he woke up. His blade would shimmer. In an instant, Enmu's head would fall off his body. Don't you dare put those words in my father's mouth. Tanjiro would say as his eyes would now become closer to that of a demon's. Moon breathing, 15th form, wailing moon's howl. Tanjiro would say as he, pin, as he spinned a full circle, releasing a powerful tornado of blades. As he killed the lower moons in an instant. Thank you, Tanjiro would say to the decaying bodies of the lower moons. Because of you, I have become stronger. Tanjiro would say as his blade's right side, which had the moon pattern, had opened up, revealing that the moons were now eyes, each eye being red and almost looking like they were on fire. Tanjiro's own left eye had turned into a brighter red, as it was closer to what his actual blade color was, with there definitely being a small pattern in his eye. He would proceed to jump over to the other side of the train. Looking over, he would see Rengoku and Nezuko battling a demon. As the demon was about to strike at Nezuko, Tanjiro would intervene, slicing the demon's arm off in an instant. Well, well, well. If it isn't Tanjiro, the demon would say mockingly. As Tanjiro got a good look at the demon, he'd see that his eye would have the number three on it. Upper Moon 3, I take it, Tanjiro would say in a cold tone. You are quite correct, although you may know me as Akaza, the demon would say, performing a short bow. You're probably wondering what we did with your father, am I correct? Aka Akaza would say, but before he could continue his sentence, Tanjiro would have his sword at the demon's neck. What did you do to my father? Tanjiro would say with a cold tone, revealing his more demonic side. Akaza would create distance as he kicked Tanjiro away. Well, well, I haven't done anything yet. Although I did take this souvenir, he'd say, revealing some of Kokoshibo's haori. Although I might have to cut off a few fingers, the demon would gloat. I've heard enough. Die, Tanjiro would say, rushing at Akza with great speed. Hino Kamikagura, sunflower thrust, he'd say, hitting Akaza in the chest as a huge hole opened up. Akaza would try to counterattack, but before he even realized it, his arms would have been cut off again. Moon breathing, third form. 
Lonesome Moon Chains. Tanjiro would say he performed two massive slashes, which left Akaza in a state where only part of his torso remained and his head. I'm gonna send you off with the first ever attack I learned from my father. Make sure to burn it into your soul so that you won't forget. Tanjiro would say, taking another breath, but at that moment he would cough up blood, as the new power he had just unlocked had hurt his body from overuse. Akaza, taking his chance, would regenerate his body and run away. Come back here, you coward! Tanjiro would say as he coughed up more blood. As he turned around, he would see the sun coming up. Shortly after, he passed out. Four months would have passed since the train incident. Tanjiro had been unconscious for these months. He had awoken, however, finding that Shinobu was sitting next to him. He felt like his senses had become a lot greater. His eyesight, hearing, smell, everything had become better. After looking for a bit, he looked at Shinobu. She had tears in her eyes whilst she was looking at him, quickly turning away to hide her tears. Tanjiro would sit straight up as he spoke. How long have I been out? He'd ask curiously. About four months, Shinobu would say, wiping her tears in the process. What happened to the demons we were fighting? And what happened to Nezuko? Tanjiro would ask, worried about his sister. They're okay. They are training with the flame Hashira, Shinobu said with a smile. Tanjiro slowly got up. He stood next to Shinobu, only something had changed. He is taller than her now, by quite a bit. Did I grow? He'd ask curiously. The obvious answer was yes. But Shinobu had already pulled out a measuring rope, as she and one of the little girls would measure his height. He was now 185 centimeters tall, or about 6 feet which was an entire foot over Shinobu as she had to look up to him now. Tanjiro, however, was feeling up his own body. His muscles had condensed a lot, but he hadn't actually lost any real weight. In fact, it felt like he could become stronger if he trained now, as if his body had adjusted to match his rate of growth. Tanjiro would want to say something, but before he could, his stomach would growl. Shinobu, laughing, would pull him along to the kitchen, where they ate dinner together. After dinner, Tanjiro wanted to train, to get used to his new body, as he asked for a Nitrin blade. However, when the Kakuchi under Shinobu had brought his blade out, it had been broken. The Kakuchi who had brought Tanjiro back had started explaining what happened. Apparently, after Tanjiro had passed out, he let go of his blade, which made it snap, purely because of the pressure he had put on it being released. Haganazaka-san won't be happy about this, Tanjiro said worried for his own life. You can use our wooden training swords if you want, Shinobu would say, pointing over to the training room she had for her and Kanoe executively. For real? Thank you so much, Tanjiro would say, giving a big smile which left Shinobu blushing. He'd entered the training room, finding Kanoe already there. The girl's gaze turned to one of surprise and wonder, but when she saw Shinobu behind Tanjiro, she'd compose herself. Tanjiro walked over to the sword rack as he grabbed a wooden blade. How about a quick spar, Tanjiro would say, giving a devious smile to the Hashra and her younger sister. Are you st sure? You're still recovering, Shinobu would say. How about a 1v1, Kanoe would say, surprising Shinobu. She was suppressing her feelings this entire time, but she didn't like how Tanjiro treated Shinobu on Mount Natugomo, not one bit, and it had been stuck with her since. Before Shinobu could say anything, Tanjiro had accepted. Kanoe had got up from her position as she was heading to the wooden sword rack. Hold it, Tanjiro would say, catching the girl off guard. Use your Nitrin blade, he'd say, giving a serious stare. Now that's going too far, Shinobu would be worried for his safety. Shinobu, stay out of it. I'm telling her to use her Nitrin blade. Shinobu let out a sigh, but accepted it. Kanoe drew her sword and got into a stance. She couldn't see any openings at all, even though Tanjiro wasn't in a sword stance. Tanjiro himself took a breath. All his senses were going haywire, so he calmed down and focused. When he opened his eyes, he could see Kanoe's bone structure, organs, and so on. He had already unlocked the transparent world, but something was different. It, it was like he could see a sort of energy throughout her body, and it just didn't look natural. He had heard it from his father, but his father had also seen something like this before, but he even couldn't tell Tanjiro. Now, whenever 
Koko Shibo spoke of the transparent world, he always explained it like it took a great deal of focus and wasn't something you could just get in your natural state. Even Tanjiro, who did have the transparent world, he didn't really have control over it, but now it was like second nature. He could just switch it on and off without even having to focus that much. And what's strange was he could see this energy as well flowing throughout Kanoe's body. Not only that, but he could feel his own blood, demonic and human, coursing through his body. He could feel his own aura and everything. Not a single vibration went past him. He closed his eyes again, relaxing a bit to take this all in. In that second, Kanoe took her chance as she saw an opening. As she swung her blade, however Tanjiro had seen and felt her movements, he opened his eye again, preparing to counterattack. His eye had turned a bit redder again, just a bit but not a lot. He swung his blade, deflecting Kanoe's attack with such force she had to take two back steps. He didn't let it end there, he swung his blade downwards upon Kanoe, the latter is trying her best to block. A loud bang could be heard, a stunned Kanoe just stood there holding her blade upwards. Shinobu, who was standing at an awkward angle, hadn't seen what happened, but decided it would be safe to call off the fight. Tanjiro, it's your win, she'd say getting closer. No, I lost, Tanjiro would say as Shinobu could finally see what had happened. The room was a bit darker than others, which had also severely blocked the view, but upon getting closer, she could see. Tanjiro's own immense strength had broken his wooden blade before it could come into contact with Kanoe. Not only that, but the roof had been damaged severely from the wind pressure alone, and on the other side of the room, the other half of Tanjiro's blade had gone through the wall. Shinobu took a second to process this as she went up to Kanoe, who was frightened beyond belief. Tanjiro just turned around, grabbed another sword as he went outside to start his actual training. Tanjiro would go out. Upon going outside, however, he felt a scorching heat over his body. The heat would quickly pass, however, but it still surprised Tanjiro a lot. He'd start his training. One, he wanted to know what his, this energy he felt was. Could this be a blood demon or was his first thought. And he also needed to control his new strength, although he could definitely expand his strength now that his body was more refined. He still needed to get used to the change. Two weeks would pass as Tanjiro took this time to train and bond with Shinobu. Two crows would land, one near Tanjiro and another near Shinobu who was watching him train. The crow would speak and tell Tanjiro and Shinobu to attend the next Hashira meeting, which was supposed to happen in a week. Shinobu's crow left after that but Tanjiro's didn't. The crow told Tanjiro that his new Nitrin would be finished in another month. Tanjiro asked why it would take so long but the crow wouldn't answer and left. Tanjiro continued training until the Hashra meeting, where they all met up. Ubeyashiki, whose condition had worsened but was still fine, spoke. He started by thanking all the Hashra for their work. As he looked around, he noticed all the Hashra and Inosuke, Nezuko, and Zenitsu. But he hadn't spotted Tanjiro or Shinobu yet. Are Shinobu and Tanjiro not attending? He'd ask, looking at his aide. They should be, master, the aide would say, confused as well. Brother is awake? Nesuko would ask excitedly, raising her voice a bit. Some of the Hashra got a bit offended, but Ubiashiki smiled. Yes, and he's doing fine, although his appearance has changed a bit from what I've heard, Ubiashiki would say, smiling and laughing a bit. Sanami started berating them for being late, however, Rengoku would speak up and defend Tanjiro and Shinobu. He was grateful to Tanjiro for putting his life on the line to protect all the passengers and his fellow demon slayers, and was angry at his own weakness. However, he wouldn't let anyone badmouth him. Before Sanami could speak, a crash could be heard. The smoke quickly settled as there was Tanjiro, who was carrying Shinobu like a princess. Upon seeing the others, he dropped Shinobu. Oh, you're so rough, she'd say getting up. Well, we're only late because you had to do your makeup, Tanjiro would reply as he finally saw his sister amongst the Hashra. He'd quickly run over and hug her, without saying anything his hug got accepted and returned. I'm glad you could join us, Tanjiro, Ubiashiki would say with a grandiose smile. The other Hashra, however, angry at first, calmed down after seeing Ubiashiki smile. This meeting was in fact called because of Tanjiro's achievements, Ubiashiki would say, as all the Hashra stood after he gestured. They all knew what was coming. 
Finally, I will reveal to you what happened four months ago. Ubiashiku says he started explaining everything, from the train to the lower moons and even Akaza. The Hashra stood mostly amazed. Although most of them had taken down a lower moon or two, they had never taken on four lower moons at the same time. And with Ubiashiki explaining the entire boosted blood situation got the Hashra wondering if they were upper moon level or not. He continued explaining and told them about Akaza and everything that had happened. The Hashra commended Tom Tanjiro for his actions, however Ubiyashiki didn't stop there. I would like to propose Tanjiro as our 10th Hashura, he'd say with a confident look. The other Hashuras didn't object, as having Tanjiro amongst their ranks would be quite helpful. Tanjiro didn't like the thought at first, but after thinking about the benefits he agreed. Then let it be known, as of today, Tanjiro Tsujikuni will be our Eclipse Hashura. Ubiyashiki smiled as he said this. Tanjiro's hand tattoo would also change to that of a half sun, half moon. He got a bit confused, but then he saw that in the middle it was a bit darkened out. What did he mean by eclipse? Tanjiro's breathing was obviously sun or moon breathing, and often water breathing as well. He didn't have this eclipse breathing that Ubiyashiki talked about. But he didn't mind. He just went along with it. The other Hashra clapped. Now moving on, I wanted to propose an idea, Ubiyashiki would say grabbing the attention of all the Hashra. I wanted to propose a training session between the Hashra, Tanjiro and his friends, Ubiyashiki would say with a smile. The Hashra seeing a window to improve themselves agreed, and Tanjiro just wanted to fight them anyway so he agreed as well. For the next three months this training would happen, and this training made all of them quite a bit stronger. And although three months was the initial time given by Ubiyashiki, Tantro heard about the training, he proposed his own idea. The first three months would become a training session between the Hashras, their Tsugoku, and Tanjiro's sister and his friends. This was not only to get Tanjiro used to his new body, but it was also a method for them to get stronger and be able to team up in missions if needed. In these three, mo in these three months, everybody's strength had already greatly multiplied. Tanjiro learned everyone's breathing techniques, or at least he did so by observing serving, and he did his this because of the offer he made with Ubiyashiki. However, he didn't sit still. He'd have sparring sessions with the Hashra, and he'd even learn some of their special techniques. Overall, each Hashra definitely became a lot stronger with Tanjiro there, as they had a goal set in mind. The three months breezed by, and everybody that partook in the training was at least previous Hashra level strength now. Most of the Hashra even awakened their Demon Slayer mark, and in conjunction, the Crimson Red Blade. Tanjiro's proposal, however, was simple. The entire Demon Slayer Corps would start a training session that would last another three months, led by Tanjiro, who would not only be learning from everybody present, but also helping them attain new heights using what his father taught him and what he himself learned throughout his life, simply by just guiding them. Before this training session was supposed to start, Tanjiro's sword finally got made. It took an additional two months for Haganezuka to make his sword, as he wanted it to be the utmost perfect blade. When he came to reveal the blade, all the Hashra attended. After all, the strongest amongst their ranks was about to receive a special blade, something made from a very rare ore found on Mount Yoko, even rarer than the Nitrin ore. Haganezuka would start his explanation. He'd start saying things about how he tried making a sword out of metal alone, but that it was way too brittle and would break too easily. So he explained that the extra two months were used to make Tanjiro's old sword, reforge it, and use it in conjunction with the new sword, which led to Tanjiro's sword being rebirthed. He'd reveal the blade, and a lot had changed. The scabbard that the blade was in had a gold and black pattern spiraling down the length of the scabbard. The guard and hilt had also changed matching the scabbard, yet when Tanjiro pulled out the blade and gripped it, it had turned into its pattern from before, yet two things were different. The moons on the blade had turned golden, and the actual blade color had turned crimson red. The balance of the sword was near perfect, not perfect, but near perfect, and not only that, it was nice and sharp. Tanjiro slashed it a few times with it and thanked Haganezuka. He could tell that this blade was special, he didn't know if it would survive if he used his full power, but he still found it a very nice blade. Haganezuka, however, bowed before Tanjiro, saying that if he ever broke, he'd make it even stronger. Shortly after the statement, he'd left. Tanjiro and the Hashra training started. 
He'd mostly trained the Hashras and his friends and family, but some of the promising demon slayers caught his eyes and were pulled into the training sessions. After the first week of receiving Tanjo's training, he'd spar with each Hashra. Most of them had already developed from the training they received. Even Shinobu, who couldn't wield a real sword because of her lacking strength, was now more than capable to do so. Her blade had to end up being upgraded a bit so she could alternate between poison and decapitating, something she couldn't do before but could definitely do now, and with her immense speed, it was a given that she would become a demon slayer. She had also ended up getting her demon slayer mark in this time, which was one of the main reasons she could do this. Tanjiro saw growth in each Hashra and told them their weaknesses and strengths, what to work on and what to do. He made them go through training for one week, just so he could test them at the end of the week. He had told them that if they didn't get strong enough to satisfy him in the two plus months they were given, then he said they shouldn't bother trying to aim higher. Rengoku and Tengen were the only two that were told their major weaknesses, as they were the most lacking out of the Hashra and Tanjiro's opinion. He had told Rengoku that it took him too long to use his forms, as if he was bound by the forms instead of letting them come to the battle naturally. He was also told that he took too long using them, that he shouldn't restrict the destructive power but precision he was given. Tengen, however, took too long to analyze his enemies. His musical score ability was really impressive, is what Tanjiro had deduced, yet he told him that he took way too long on preparing it, showing off that even him, someone who had good hearing yet still worse than Tengen, could also use the ability, and he was showing it off as if he had mastered it years ago. Now this was partially also due to the transparent world that Tanjiro could do this, but he just told Tengen to focus, and that was all he said. Tengen took note of this, and the rest of the three months under Tanjiro went by rather quickly. He'd help them with their weak points, and they'd help the demon slayers under them, and so on. Everybody grew a lot out of these last six months, however, Tanjiro's final test came. Luckily, everybody passed without a single issue. Every slayer who wasn't already Kinoe rank, but had the potential to be Kinoe, got promoted to Kinoe, and this was to ensure that the slayers could live comfortably whilst also being called if an emergency happened. Good work everybody, Tanjiro would say putting a cup in the air as they wanted to celebrate the success of the training. All the Hashra followed, they had become like a family, even Hashra like Giyu or Obanai who were usually quite shy and had really warmed up to the whole group. Nezuko, Inosuke and Zenitsu were also there and they partied the night away. However, Tanjiro had left early, as he had a meeting with Ubiashiki. He'd meet up with the leader of the Demon Slayer Corps, whose condition had greatly worsened. He had already lost so much blood and his face was almost completely covered by the curse. They talk and talk and talk and talk and talk until silence befell them. Tanjiro had sort of become great friends with Ubiashiki, and they loved sharing stories. Tanjiro spoke a lot about his father, and Ubiashiki talked a lot about the Demon Slayer Corps and its history. However, when their conversations came to an end, the only real noise you could hear was the heavy breathing of Ubiashiki, who was struggling to sit upright. Tanjiro spoke. I think I might be able to cure you, he said as he stood up. That's quite alright. I was destined to die. However, you are destined to end Muzan's life, not to save mine. Ubishiki would say softly, say as he struggled some more. Why not do both? Tanjiro said as his eye had changed color again, back to the red it was ten months ago. Not fully, but still a bit. When he fought those lower moons, Tanjiro could see this aura or energy flowing in everybody. At first he didn't understand it, but after thinking about it, he realized it was linked to his blood demon art. He knew he'd have one, but how to use it was still a mystery to him. He tried making the foreign energy in Ubiashiki's body leave. However, he couldn't get it to do that, so he absorbed it instead. Ubiashiki's whose curse mark completely disappeared, was astonished. He no longer struggled to breathe, and it was like a heavy weight had been lifted off of his shoulders. However, one of Tanjiro's fingers decayed, but it regenerated again shortly after, almost instantly. That vile energy was definitely linked to Muzan, was Tanjiro's thought. However, they just enjoyed the moment. They both joined the Hashra after enjoying some sake, and they celebrated. Not only did they celebrate their growth, but their master's recovery as well. 
Two more months would pass by rapidly. In fact, these two months were quite absurd. Tanjiro and Shinobu had become a couple. After a very long time of people debating if they were or not. It was quite a surprise to most of the Demon Slayer Corps, but they fit well together. Tanjiro, who didn't have any missions at the moment, was staying at Shinobu's mansion. He heard some screams and decided to check it out, finding Tangen, who was trying to take away Aoi, and some of the attendant girls. What do you think you're doing? Tanjiro would say with a dominating presence, which scared Tangen a bit. After all, he did train with Tanjiro for over half a year. He knew how terrifying this man could be. He put the girls down as he started talking about the reason he needed them. Hmm... That explains a lot, but these girls won't be of much use in battle, so how about you take us instead? Tanjiro would say with a confident look. In that moment, Nezuko, Inosuke, and Zenitsu would show up returning from their missions. Tengen thought about it, and seeing how Tanjiro was a really handsome guy, they could probably pass him off as a handsome girl as well. Shinobu, who was also nearby, came outside. After hearing the situation from Aoi, she proposed joining their mission as well. But Tanjiro rejected her proposal even before Tengen could, saying how two Hashra should already be way more than enough. Shinobu was a bit let down, but Tanjiro just patted her head. We're off, alright? See you later. It says they set out shortly after. They'd follow Tengen with relative ease, after all. Of them were at least at the previous Hashra's levels. Zenitsu was al also attended the training, was a lot more confident about himself now, and he could easily keep up with the speed that Tanjiro was putting out, if he gave it his all. That's the level he had gotten to. Nesco had almost complete control over her blood art, and together with her water breathing, she'd easily be able to match Tanjiro or any of the Hashra in power. Inosuke, however, he simply became stronger. Raw power was what he needed. Precision and the other training things that they had done didn't really work for him. They were secondary. They'd arrive at the entertainment district after only a day. That night, Nezuko would help everyone with their makeup, making Tantra and Inosuke look like they were models. Not only that, but she even was able to make Zenitsu look good. She herself hardly had to put on makeup. After all, she was already a beautiful young lady. Tengen would go out together with the girls, and he'd sell them off to different houses. Most of the houses were glad to take them in. Two days quickly passed whilst everyone did their jobs. Tanjiro would work diligently cleaning the place up, while Sinitsu had found one of the demons. She tried to strike him, but he easily dodged. This scared the demon who was hiding as an Oiron. Nezuko was really popular with her house as she did the makeup for the other girls, however Yunosuke wasn't as popular as he made quite a ruckus. After finding all the information they needed about the demons, they all grouped up and explained everything. That night would be the night they struck. Tanjiro would meet up with the head of his house. She obviously knew that he was a boy, but after seeing his face without makeup, she blushed a bit. Tanjiro, whose beauty had only increased after his transformation, had become even more handsome than Tengen Uzui. He'd tell her his goodbyes and give her the money for his food and lodging. However, before leaving, he'd smell something. It was faint, but it was definitely there. He left the room and ran away. However, this was just a trick. After two minutes, he rushed back to the room, finding a female demon trying to take Koinatsu. In a millisecond, he'd save her and kick the demon through the wall. The demon who revealed herself as Daki was stunned by Tanjiro's beauty as well, saying how he was equal to her master. She composed herself, however, and went in for the attack, though Tanjiro easily deflected all her strikes and sent her flying. You should run, he'd say to Koinatsu, who'd follow his advice and ran. Tanjiro ran after Daki, who was struggling to get up. Before I end you, I'd like for you to tell me where my father is being held, Tanjiro would say, holding his blade to her neck. Why should I tell you where that traitor is being held? She'd say, hitting the ground and making a massive dust cloud. She knew she couldn't fight Tanjiro, who had almost beat a boosted Akaza. Meanwhile, Tengen and Inosuke and Zenitsu had found their lair. They easily freed all the girls that were captured there. The demon sentient band that was there knew they couldn't do anything, so they went back to Daki, revealing her true form, as she had white hair. All the demon slayers rushed out, however, as she was now surrounded.
She looked around trying to find the weakest of them all to try and escape. She saw Zenitsu and assumed he'd be the weakest as she rushed at him. Before she had a chance to register what happened, though she'd be decapitated by Zenitsu. She started wailing and crying, which confused a group of slayers. Why wasn't she disintegrating? However, she would scream out, Brother! In that instant, another demon showed up as if it was attached to her. He'd send out slash attacks towards the slayers. Tanjiro intercepted, though. He took a breath. Moon breathing. Thirteenth form. Moonlit Lake Reflection. He'd say as he made a calm movement which grabbed all the blades in a second, and he'd crash them into the ground. No way he stopped that attack, Kyutro, the demon who had appeared, would say. He quickly helped his sister regenerate. They both realized they stood no chance, so they grabbed a bottle of red liquid. Before the slayers could stop them, they had already drunk it. This had made the demon stronger by a lot. Gutro was easily able to match Upper Moon 4 now, and Daki could even match Upper Moon 5. Tanjiro, Tengen would say, getting his attention. Let us take care of this. After all, we have to see our own limits, right? Tengen would say with a distinguished look of confidence. Alright. You and Nezuko take the brother, and Inosuke and Zenitsu take the girl. Tanjiro would say, patting his sister on the head, as he walked back to observe. The fight started and really quickly it turned into a one-sided battle. Daki and Gutro were getting destroyed. Although Zenitsu couldn't cut Daki's neck right away, it didn't matter, as he'd just pin her down and Inosuke would easily cut through, using his blade as, as a saw. She got decapitated first, in under 4 minutes, whilst Gutro was only able to defend himself. Tengen's speed and precision had increased a lot, and every time Gutro sent out an attack, Tengen instantly deflected or stopped the attack, as if he knew what was gonna happen. This was the fruit of their training. Tengen's musical score had evolved to the next level, a level where he could hear the opponent's muscles move and predict their next action. A sort of transparent world without an actual transparent world, a version of transparent world almost solely using hearing as its basis, one could say. Nezuko was no joke either, one of her attacks was devastating and hurt Gutero even if he blocked, simply because of her flames getting on his skin and burning him. It didn't take long for him to get decapitated either, as he only lasted 6 minutes. So you're gonna tell me where my father is? Tanjiro would say, picking up Daki's head. She just cried silently as she started blaming them and her brother for her loss. He'd simply cover her mouth as he went over to Yutaro and asked the same question. B let go of my sister, he'd say, trying to bite Tanjiro. Daki saw this and started crying louder. Tanjiro let go of her and put their heads next to each other. Oi, your father... He's in the Infinity Castle, Gutro would say, looking at Tanjiro with an angered look. That wasn't so hard, was it? Tanjiro would say, patting them. Both sim siblings simply started shouting at him to shut up. Tanjiro still felt bad for them. He felt something strange about these two. His nails would change, and he entered another trance, like that time he was in a dream. His nails would enter the sibling's skin. What was happening, Tanjiro thought to himself. He could feel his own blood leaving his body. It wasn't a lot, but still he could feel it. The siblings erupted into piles of flesh before shrinking into a small girl with white hair and a boy just a bit taller than her. Tanjiro woke up from his trance and backed off. What was happening? The demons they had fought just a second ago had turned into almost childlike version of themselves. Tanjiro would look over, but the bodies of Daki and Gutro were still disappearing. The brother started crying as he called out his sister, Ume, as he hugged her tightly. Tanjiro, what happened? Sinitsu would be confused. He didn't hear the sound of a demon, and he only softly heard the sound humans make. Gyutra and Daki came up to Tanjiro and hugged him. What happened? he asked, confused. They didn't smell like that man anymore, and they resembled humans. Tanjiro, you are like him. You became a progenitor, Gyutra would say. I don't feel like a demon anymore, yet I know that I still have my powers. He'd continue, extending his hand and summoning a scythe from it. So we should just decapitate you again, is that what you're saying? Tengen would say, extending his blade to Gutro's neck, yet Tanjiro waved him off. Gutro would speak up again. I'm sure we can't atone for the sins we committed as demons, but that's why I'd like to ask you to let us join you in fighting Kibutsuji Muzan. 
I don't understand why, but it's as if I can think clearly now that I'm no longer linked to that man. I don't want Ume to be hurt anymore, too. Please let us help. Before Tanjiro could say anything, or Tengen, or anybody could speak up, Gyutaro would kneel. I, Gyutaro, swear my loyalty to you. Tanjiro Tsujikuni. I'm sure I'll be of help in finding where your father is, too. It says he got onto his one knee. I'm confused by what is going on, but I can tell something within both of you has changed, like how my father changed in the past. You'll have to go through interrogations of the Demon Slayer corpse, but I'll take you both as my subordinates after that. Tanjiro would say as he took out his blade. Now before we continue take talking, I'll have to fight you, won't I? Tanjiro would look up to a building, and there stood Akasa. Tanjiro's gaze quickly turned to hate, and so did Nezuko's. After all, Akasa was wearing the kimono that their father would wear, half of Tanjiro's and the other half being Kokoshibo's. I don't know what you did to those two, but Master seems quite mad, so I'll be taking everybody's life here. After all, after feasting on your father for so long, I've risen to become Upper Moon too. He'd say with a smirk as he rushed at Tanjiro with great speed. Tantra entered his unnamed form and blocked Akaza. You know, since the last time we fought, many crazy things happened. I started feeling this strange energy, and it's confounding. I think I might be my demon blood art, but it seems like I can do almost anything. Tantra's blade started changing again like it did in the past. His aura changed as he resembled a demon more than a human. Both his eyes turned bloodshot red, something that hadn't happened yet. Akaza, however, couldn't feel his bloodlust. Tanjo had reached the stage of selflessness that he wanted so bad. Akaza would rush at Tanjo, however, the boy slashed off his hands before he could even react. The speed Tanjo was showcasing was greater than even Muzan's. His precision was insanely good, and the fear Akaza was feeling at this moment even surpassed that which he had for his master. After all, he had taunted this man who cared about his father so much that there was no way he could get an easy death. Tanjiro ran towards Akaza, and even now his cells were scared. Muzan's cells were terrified. This man didn't remind them of Yoroichi. He, he looked like a more demonic version of him. Akaza yelled out, and the doors opened in an instant, as he got grabbed by a massive tentacle arm and dragged out of there. Tanjiro would see this, and right before the doors closed, he took a breath. Moon breeding, fifth form into fourteenth form. Calamitous Catastrophe Moon Spirit. He'd say as he unleashed three to six slashes, four of which entered the door, the other two clashed against the door and dispersed. Tanjiro had realized that moon breathing is like a blood demon art. He had realized this many months ago, however, if he focused hard enough, he could combine multiple forms into each other. The two that hit the door and dispersed only dispersed because Tantro wanted them to disperse. The ones that reached inside, however, blew up into many smaller slashes, which devastated the Infinity Castle a good bit, even hurting some of the demons there, including Muzan, who was furious. Tanjiro after just changed back to his normal self and fell to his knees. He was a bit exhausted from trying all these new things at once, but he had to send a message, and he succeeded. The slayers there had to start returning to the Demon Slayer corpse. After all, they had found out that Tanjiro could potentially cure demons. This was a huge discovery. The sun slowly came up, but Ume and Kitro went unharmed. The Kakushi came in and started their cleaning, whilst the others all set out for the Demon Slayer core. The Slayers started heading back to the Demon Slayer HQ. They had work to do and people to interrogate, namely Ume and Gyutaro. A Hashra meeting was called. Upon getting back, they talk about what to do with Ume and Gyutaro. They didn't look like demons anymore, and they looked more human. Ume looked to be around 18 to 19, whilst Gyutaro looked to be in his 20s. Their real ages are, of course, hundreds of years, but they too had become something different from demons. I propose to take these two in as my subordinates. They won't harm humans from this point onwards, of course, and I'll work them to the bone for them to atone for their sins. But we generally could use their help. Tandra proposed this to Ubiashiki. 
Yet the other Hashras were agitated. They didn't want to accept these people as they had already killed many slayers and humans in their time of being demons. Tandro didn't really care, after all he was something different from a demon as well. Shinobu also couldn't really accept it, even though she'd do anything for Tandro in a heartbeat. This was something too difficult to decide by themselves. You guys forget that these two used to be upper moons. The information they have is worth an infinite amount to compare to what we know, Tandro said to calm down a few of the Hashra. Ubiashiki raised his hand slowly, the Hashra went silent in an instant. We could use information, after all we are stuck in this dilemma of not knowing about the upper moons, Ubiashiki said as he got closer. Tell us everything you know. After that, you are free to be under Tandro as his subordinates, Ubiashiki said as he sat down. The Hashra proceeded to do the same as well. It was around dinner time, so Kakushi had brought out food for all the slayers and Ubiashiki. They had brought out an outdoor table as every Hashra sat down next to each other. In the end, Tandro sat next to Shinobu. To his left sat Gyutaro and Ume, who he shared his meal with. Ubiashiki sat opposite of all the Hashra in front of Tanjiro. Everybody started eating whilst listening closely to Gyutaro and Ume. How about you guys start explaining the upper moons and their abilities, Ubiashiki said as he took a sip of his tea. Gyutaro would start speaking. Well, to start off we have Gyoko, upper moon 5. His initial appearance is that of an armless statue growing out of a porcelain vase, I guess you could say. But this isn't his true form. He's got, like, other forms. They're a bit weird, but yeah, he's got other forms. That's about all I know about that. Where, in those forms, he is stronger, though. So I do have to warn you if you're gonna fight him. Uh, try to finish him before he goes into that form. Kyutaro was stumbling upon his words a bit. He was a bit stressed out. After all, he felt so much pressure of all the gazes upon him. But he got a pat on the back from Tanjiro, and he continued on. He's one of short temper. He is arrogant and shallow, so you could use this to your advantage, I guess. Abilities, I only know a few. After all, most of the upper moons keep to themselves. His blood demon art is revolved around the porcelain vases he summons. He can move kind of instantly between them, which makes it hard to catch him. All I know that is his blood demon art is related to the vases, Gutro would say whilst eating some tempura. Ubiashiki nodded and most of the Hashra seemed satisfied with this information. Continue. Tanjiro would say before even Ubiashiki could. Next up is Upper Moon 4, Han Tengu. He himself is a coward. I say he himself because he can create four clones of himself to defeat him. You need to behead the original Han Tengu. Also the four clones and him, but his clones are as powerful as Upper Moon demons and they can fuse to the point where they are almost as strong as Akaza used to be. That's about all I know. Once again, everybody nodded. Gyutaro continued. Upper Moon 3. His name is Doma. He used to be in Upper Moon 2, but Akaza took his position. He is the leader of a cult, that's about all I know about that. He uses golden war fans, and he also uses a sort of frost power which can freeze your lungs, and his blood demon art is related to ice. Once again, all the Hashra nodded beside Shinobu. She sat next to Tantro, but was holding onto his hand quite angered. He calmed her down, though. Gyutaro went on. Upper Moon 2. Akaza. As I said, he used to be Upper Moon 3, but he started devouring pieces of Upper Moon 1 and started receiving lots of blood from Muzan. I don't know why Muzan is showing such favor to Akaza all of a sudden, but anyway, he has white skin and he has tattoos all over his body. His blood demon art is related to martial arts, and he's very sensitive to people's bloodlust, so attacking him is almost impossible. Gyutaro didn't have much more to say. Ubiashiki, however, asked him to continue. Well, Upper Moon 1, Kokoshibo is currently being held in the Infinity Castle. Muzan is trying to turn him back into a loyal pawn, but so far it hasn't been working that well. So as punishment, Muzan allows Akasa to eat pieces of him to gain strength. In terms of strength, he is someone capable of standing up to Muzan, though. He never really went all out, however. 
for reasons I do not know, but in each blood battle I watched, it seemed like he was straining himself somehow. Kyutaro stopped speaking after this, as Tanjiro looked quite agitated. Hash the Hashiro once again nodded. Ubiyashiki asked about Muzan, but Kyutaro didn't know any of his abilities, so the conversation ended there. When asked about the Infinity Castle, Gyutro explained that there is a demon who opens the portals and he himself can't open it. The rest of the meeting talked about Muzan's goals and that was about it. Gyutro and Ume got accepted by Ubiyashiki as Tanjiro's underlings. The next four months were used as training. Gyutro and Ume learned bre breathing styles from Tanjiro as they both could use the power boost. Gyutro started learning boon breathing and Ume started learning flower breathing under Kanoe. They were both quite exceptional in their own rights, but what was weird was that Ume had an exceptional affinity to flower breathing, almost to the point where she could rival Kanoe easily after only one month. But of course, experience outgrew, and well, Ume had been fighting for hundreds of years now, so obviously she'd be a match for Kanoe. The two of them got really close as Kanoe and Ume started to train together more often, and while well, they just talked about girly things as Kanoe opened up a lot more just from being around Ume, who was quite open as a person. Tanjiro learned more about blood demon arts from both Daki and Gutro, further boosting his understanding of his own powers. After an intense spar with Gutro, Tanjiro's blade would crack once more. His physical strength had once again exploded, and his blood demon art had once again evolved. It was like this continuous spiral that he just couldn't get out of. He just kept getting stronger. His muscles kept expanding but condensing so that his form would stay the same and he could exert his maximum speed. It's like his body was just trying to form itself to become the ultimate weapon. After talking to his sword problem with Ubiyashiki, they would tell him to go to the swordsmith village, so Tanjiro got escorted by the Kakoshi. Gyutaro followed along as he as ordered by Tanjiro. Ubiyashiki wanted to make sure Gyutaro wouldn't do any misdeeds, so he sent Shinobu along to oversee him. The reason why Gyutaro wanted to go in the first place was because he brought up a very interesting theory he had, and he wanted to test it out, and Tanjiro actually thought that he should do the exact same. So he told him to go along, and he first obviously got the permission. They arrived at the swordsmith village where they found the village chief, who thanked them for coming. Tanjiro got told to go to the hot springs whilst Shinobu and Gyutaro got assigned a swordsmith. Tanjiro arrived at the hot spring where he was greeted by a familiar face. Hello Mitsuri, how's it going? He would say, waving at her. Mitsuri blushed as she stumbled upon her words. She waved back to Tanjiro but stayed silent. Tanjiro entered the hot springs as he sparked casual conversation with Mitsuri. She, like many other females of the Demon Slayer Corps, had completely fallen in love with Tanjiro, simply because of his good looks. But Tanjiro also met all the requirements she had set off becoming or being stronger than herself. So he seemed to be a perfect fit, yet his heart already belonged to Shinobu. They talked, but after that Tanjiro got approached by another familiar Hashira, Muichiro Tokito. He entered the hot spring along Tanjiro as they all started having a fun conversation with each other. Muichiro had become something like Tanjiro's younger brother, as they got along amazingly well. And Muichiro wanted to get stronger as well, so getting tips from Tanjiro from time to time was something he regularly did. They got approached by a little boy who told Tanjiro to follow him. Tanjiro did as they found Haga Nezuka who was training. When he saw Tanjiro, he bowed. Excuse me, Tanjiro, for my poor performance. If only I could have made a stronger blade for you. Tanjiro, however, walked past Haga Nezuka as he came face to face with a doll. Oh, that is Yuroichi Type Zero. We used it to train slayers, but it's in a pretty bad shape. Tanjiro admired the contraption for a second. This puppet was made after my father's younger brother, the creator of the original Breath. Tanjiro would say, surprising both Haga Nezuka and the boy who owned the puppet. Could I fight this thing whilst it's in its strongest setting? I feel like I could learn a thing or two that would help me become stronger, Tanjiro would say as he pulled out his blade. The boy who owned the puppet was hesitant at first, but after hearing what Tanjiro had said, he felt that this was a battle he had to observe, and so he had turned on the puppet on its strongest setting. 
The fight started as both Tondra and the puppet went at each other's throats, at full power. Clash after clash, attack after attack. They didn't stop. Two to three hours would go by of both sides clashing with each other. The puppet had gone and attacked Tondra with three arms at a time. Each one of these blows were equal to one of Tondra's forms. The fight continued, blow after blow, until the puppet dashed at Tondro, all six of its arms extending backwards as they came down in a slashing motion from above. Tondro took a breath and for the first time in his entire time fighting the puppet he unleashed an actual proper form. Moon breathing, 17th form. Reverse waterfall in moonlit heavens, Tondro would say as his blade crashed down into the puppets. His blade released many cuts like how Gyutaro's blood demon art worked, yet they got bigger and bigger until two of the arms of the puppet broke off. Yet its power didn't decrease. It's like the puppet had gone into overdrive as it was pushed down harder on Tondro than before. Tondro's blade, which had turned crimson red, started glowing. The energy Tondro could control, he was pouring it all into the blade, as the light got so bright that the people watching got blinded. All of a sudden, a loud bang could be heard. Tondro's blade had exploded. Many of the chunks went flying throughout the forest. Not only of Tondro's blade, but also the puppet's four remaining blades had also blown up. Nobody got hit by the blades, but the fight wasn't over. The puppet went in and tried hitting Tondra with its four fists. Tondra had hit the puppet in the chest before the fist could reach him, and with an open palm the puppet blew up. Everyone watching couldn't believe their eyes, however they saw that Tondra was holding a blade. A blade that was stuck in the puppet's chest. Haganezuka walked up to Tondra and asked him if he could work on the blade for him. However, Tondra asked him if they could work on it together. When Haganezuka asked him why, he explained that Gyudro wanted to try and combine his blood demon technique with Nitrin ore to make it stronger. When Tondra proposed that they do the same, Haganezuka was ecstatic. So, with Muichiro guarding Haganezuka's work shed, the two started getting to work. Tondra would simply infuse the energy that he used to trigger his blood demon arts into the blade which seemed to work fine. They were working hard on the blade. Two days had passed, this was all the time it had taken Gyutro to upgrade his sights with Nitrin Ore together with a smith. He had gone and followed Shinobu as they found Muichiro. He stopped dead in his tracks though. I smell blood. As he started running into a direction, it didn't take him long to find Gyoko, the Upper Moon 5 demon. Shinobu, who was carrying a flare, had shot it into the air, signaling that demons were here. The Love Pillar Mitsuri would be deployed to go assist the Swordsmith Village, which they did. Han Tengu was rather ecstatic that Gyutoro was now part of the Demon Hunters, as he'd be able to kill him. However, right as the fight started, Gyoko would start getting overpowered. Worst part was that he slowly started dying as he had been injected with poison, a poison quite potent. Shinobu had been able to make stronger poisons as she got to test them on Gyutaro and Tanjiro. She had been doing the testing on the latter for well over a year now. So any upper moon injected with her poison would have a serious problem, and would need time to digest it. However, because of Muichiro being there and Gyutaro as well, he had his hands full. The worst part was that they all outsped him by a lot. Fact was that all the Hashra had unlocked their mark besides Gyomei. So physically they were all insanely strong. Not only that, but Muichiro was able to make his blade a crimson red blade. This left Gyoko with no choice as he transformed into his true form. He was now able to keep up a bit with the Hashra although he was still pretty much stuck. He created an opening for himself by summoning a lot of fish that would attack the Hashra and Gyutaro. In that opening, he'd pull out a few vials of blood, which he quickly drank. His strength grew explosively after doing that, as he was now equal to the Slayers. On the other side of the village, Mitsuri would be fighting Hantengu, who had also drank the vials of blood, making his fused clone a lot stronger, though Mitsuri was able to keep up and she had a difficult time. 
They all held out for two more hours before they started getting exhausted and being pushed back. Shinobu got sneak attacked when she tried to take a moment to breathe, as she was about to be pursed by Gyoko. However, Tanjiro had beheaded him in that instant. He was holding Shinobu's sword, his movement was so swift and beautiful, and it used a certain amount of precision to do something like that. Yes, her blade had been modified, but that Tanjiro had used it to utmost perfection was mind-blowing. Shinobu made sure to engrave his movement into her mind. Gyoko was questioning how he got beheaded, but he disintegrated before being able to accomplish anything. Tanjiro handed Shinobu back her blade. She could tell that if he had used it any longer than he did, it would have snapped by the pressure. Weren't you working on your blade with Haganezuka? Muichiro would ask curiously. Well, you see, Haganezuka is currently doing a process where I can't really intervene, so I thought it would be so good to come out and get some fresh air, but I noticed you guys were missing and then I smelled some demons. Now then, there seems to be another demon on the other side of the village, Tanjiro said, looking over in that direction. I suspect that would be Han Tengu, Tanjiro said as he got gifted a blade by the boy who owned the Yoroichi doll. One of the blades the doll used was blown away, it was still in decent condition and would suffice. You guys rest up, I'll take care of this. Tanjiro would say as his eyes turned bloodshot red. He disappeared in an instant as he ran at as such a fast speed it looked like he almost teleported, arriving where Mitsuri and Hantangu were. Next time you small fry should bring Akaza, Tanjiro would say as he took a breath. Hino Kami Kagura, Dragon Sun Halo Head Dance. Tanjiro had decapitated both the fused demon and Han Tengu who was actually hiding within his own heart. Mitsuri started blushing as she got saved by Tanjiro. I'm gonna propose another Hashira training session to Ubiyashiki. The demons are receiving a lot of blood from Muzan, so they're gaining a lot of strength, but we only trained to match the strength of the previous upper moons. We'll have to train at least to stand against someone like my father when he goes full out. Tanjiro murmured to himself. Himitsuri was pretty scared at the fact that Tanjiro said that, but she followed him as they returned to the other Hashira. They all ate something before Tanjiro got summoned back to Haganezuka to continue working on his blade. A week went by and Tanjiro's blade got made. He held it as it started to form its colors. One side of the blade had turned pale white, whilst the other had become crimson red. Along the actual lining of the blade came a dark reddish purple line. The blade had received the scabbard that Tanjiro used to use from his father's sword, and he also had the flame guard that Rengoku gifted him on his sword, whilst the blade's hilt was lined with golden linen. This blade was perfect, as Tanjiro put all of his power onto the blade and didn't even feel close to snapping. Moving the energy of his blood demon techniques to the blade also felt really easy to do and didn't feel like it was straining the blade. He was content, and so was Haganezuka. They said their goodbyes and returned to the Demon Slayer HQ. Everyone arrived back at the Demon Slayer HQ, where Tanjiro proposed another Hashira training to Ubiyashiki, voicing his concerns. Ubiyashiki was also going to propose another training as he explained his premonition. The other Hashira who were present at all started asking questions to Muichiro, Shinobu, and Mitsuri, as they were the only ones present at the battle with the Upper Moons besides Tanjiro. Muichiro and Shinobu gave detailed explanations of their fights, whilst Mitsuru more or less stumbled on her words. Considering Ubiyashiki's premonitions, Tanjiro left. The Hashira training commenced. Every Hashira partook, even Gyu who was more or less against it thinking that he wasn't a real Hashira, yet he got encouraged by both Tanjiro and Nezuko to talk things out with him. Tanjiro was the last Hashira that Slayers had to go through, though getting to him seemed impossible to most people. Tanjiro would train himself to the extreme whilst waiting for people to arrive. He had two goals. One was to replicate the Dimension Door ability that Akaza had escaped through. The other was to gain full control over his God Eyes form, that being the name the other Hashira dubbed it. Three days into his training, the first Slayer arrived to take his training. Looking over, he'd see Nezuko. He had been so busy with Hashira work and gaining strength that he hardly saw his sister. Even when they were trying to cheer up Gyu, he had not even seen her. He came at a different time. He ran over and hugged her, and she reciprocated his hug warmly. 
You've gotten so strong. I'm surprised you got here so fast, Tondra said, patting his sister. She smiled at his acknowledgement. Let's start the training, brother, Nezuko said with a reaffirming look of determination. All right, come at me, Tondra said much to Nezuko's astonishment. Tondra held his Nitrin blade. It was still in its scabbard. The first part of his training was assessment. He'd make sure the training that the slayers got from the other Hashra was actually effective, and if it held an impact on the slayer. He'd also attack open parts of the Slayer as they attacked him. This was simply to show them their flaws and where they would have to try not to have openings. Getting to Tantra was a real hassle, however, as his training location was located on the top of a tall mountain, where the air, just like on Mount Sagiri, was very thin, making it hard to breathe. The entire purpose of this was to get the Slayers used to their explosive growth that they had undergone in that small time. Nezuko rushed at her brother. Her stance was almost perfect, so Tondro hit her where her stance could improve. Their fight ended after 10 minutes. Nezuko did amazingly well on the level of a Hashra, Tondro thought to himself, so he moved on to part 2 of the training with her passing her on part 1. Part 2 of his training was led by Yutro and Ume, who were also there. They had trained under Tanjo and received his teachings. They knew best how to assist others to grasp the concept Tanjo had put out for them. They trained each slayer differently that arrived, but most had to go through a relentless fury of attacks, their goal being to awaken their demon slayer marks. Not only that, but also increase the slayers in every aspect. If each Hashira focused on one part, Tondra's training was designed to explosively grow each aspect. Nezuko got past part two of his training after a day. The last part of Tondro's training was precision, an unwavering focus and godly precision were, were his aim. This would either awaken one of two things in the Slayer, the transparent world or the crimson red Nitrin sword everyone desired. Nezuko passed this training in half a day. Meanwhile, Tondro continued his training whilst Nezuko went to spar with some of the other Hashra to test her progress. It took another two days for somebody to reach Tandro. Between all that Hashra, almost no one succeeded. Only the most tenacious would reach Tandro. So it was a real surprise when Tandro saw both Inosuke and Zenitsu arrive. They went through Tandro's training. Zenitsu had a scent of anger on him. It made his training quite effective. He finished before Inosuke, a day ahead. Six more days would pass in where Tanjiro trained another 12 people. Today was the day that Yashiki had prophesied, so Tanjiro prepared himself, yet he didn't sense Muzan's energy, at all. In fact, in another week passed and nothing had happened. The training continued as planned, but Tanjiro didn't like this one bit. Whilst training some slayers, all the Hashra came up the mountain towards Tanjiro. What's up, guys? Tandra asked them. However, they stood quietly. From left to right stood Tengen, Rengoku, Muichiro, Mitsuri, Gyu, Shinobu, Gyomei, Sanami, and Obanai. Next to the either sides of the Hashra stood some of the stronger sling slayers that had already passed Tandra's training, including Nezuko, Zenitsu, Inosuke, and Kanoe. Tandro, you haven't sparred with any Hashra yet. Thinking about it, it made sense. You are so far ahead of us that we can't fight you one on one. So we have decided to all come at you at the same time, Rengoku said with a grandiose posture. He already knew this was gonna happen, sort of. Ubiashiki had told him that the Hashra had planned something, and so he made the assumption that they probably trained together so they could fight at the maximum together. The Hashra unsheathed their blades. The Tsugoko and other slayers amongst them did the same. This was problematic, but Tanjiro liked the challenge. It would be discourteous of me to not accept this. Tanjiro said as he unsheathed his own blade as well. Both sides stood quietly as they in an instant rushed at each other. Tengen and Gyomei came in as they both rushed in for a frontal attack. Gyomei's maze got deflected by Tanjiro, however he had to parry the blow from both Tengen's sword and Gyomei's axe. Before he was able to deflect the blow, Shinobu had rushed behind Tandro as she prepared to stab him, although Tandro curved his body in a way where he only got scratched. He took this chance to deflect Gyomei and Tengen's sword clash as he did a rotary slash using moon breathing, sending them back. Not getting the chance to breathe, however, Kyojuro, Mitsuri, Nezuko, 
Awe and Sanami all rushed in, using forms of their breathing individually. Kyodro came in with his ultimate move right from the start, his ninth form of flame breathing, Rank Goku, which landed a devastating frontal blow to Tandro, who was still able to block it, yet why was he not able to deflect the attack? He felt a bit drowsy. That's when it hit him that Shinobu used a poison attack on him. He didn't sense any poison entering his body though. Not wasting a second, Sanami came in with an Ida Ten Typhoon whilst Mitsuri used her first form of luff breathing, and Nezuko surprisingly used Hinokami Kagura Dance. All these attacks came to Tanjiro's blind spots. One of his eyes turned red as he deflected Kyodro's attack and started blocking the other attacks at a speed that the other Hashira couldn't follow. Moon Breathing Second Form Pearl Flower Moon Gazing, Tandra would say releasing many crescent-shaped slashes towards the other Hashira. However, a wound would appear on Tandra's chest, a deep cut. Zenitsu had taken this chance to unleash a his full speed, attacking Tandra who hadn't noticed him. Obanai had also prepared a sneak attack as he had hit Tandra in the side. Tandro healed up really quickly as he got into another stance. Before he could unleash an attack though, both Tengen and Inosuke came in this time. As he was about to kick them away, Muichiro came in and slashed right at Tandro. He would have been able to block the attack if Gyu hadn't intervened. The fight continued even when Tandro got hit as he simply healed. But what was happening? Tandro was getting overpowered easier and easier. Was it the poison? No, that couldn't be because he had already digested it a while ago. It could have been the Hashra's teamwork as they were perfectly intercepting him every time, but he had sparred with them before. This couldn't have been it right. Had he simply grown weaker? Tandra getting pushed into a corner awakened something inside of him. His eyes flared up as they turned crimson red and started bleeding. His eye color had changed to something that hadn't happened before. His mark lit up as well as it was actually on fire. Tandro started fighting back more ferociously, though more wild and not as refined as he usually fought. He had gone into a semi-berserk state. His power may have explosively grown, but the lack of proper position really cost him, as he was even easier to dodge and combo. Tandro was getting mad at his own weakness. How could he let himself get overpowered? At the moment, he didn't have the thought of his friends in mind. It felt like he was drowning, and he hated it. The Hashra had prepared another attack, however, before they could arrive at Tandro, a massive energy wave pushed them back. The atmosphere went tense and a light laughter could be heard. Dust was everywhere, but when it settled, a most terrifying sight appeared before the Hashra. Tandro had grown a horn. His sword laid on the ground and his nails had become sharp claws. His teeth had grown and his mark had become black, yet it still looked like it was on fire. Some people were terrified simply because they knew that Tandro had gone berserk. He was, after all, laughing maniacally. Some of the Hashra stepped into action right away as they rushed at Tandro. However, they got swatted away like flies. Shinobu tried to talk sense into Tandro, however, he was completely out of it. All the Hashra decided it would be best to subdue him right now, as they all rushed at him. Together, Nezuko, Zenitsu, Kanoe, and Inosuke didn't sit still either, rushing at Tandro as well. They got hit by another energy wave, knocking most of them down. Without realizing it, they had all been hit by Tandro's attacks, though all minor wounds. Meanwhile, Tandro was struggling within his own mind, or subconscious. The thoughts of being weak and non-reliant dawned on him. How could he defeat Muzan if he couldn't handle the Hashra with or his own demonic powers? He was despairing. For the second time in his entire life, he felt despair, and he was sinking in it. A thick water was engulfing him. Before f being fully submerged, he'd be dragged out. His mother stood there, amongst his brothers and sisters. He went to hug them, but they disappeared as he fell. He got back up to, that, to see that the scenery from before the infinite swamp had disappeared. Around him stood a field of flowers. Was this a memory? Tondro thought. He walked through the field, finding two tall men standing there. Father? Tondro yelled out as he ran towards his father, yet again phasing right through him. Brother, we've made no progress in beating the demons, and even more frustrating is that nobody seems to be able to learn our breathing styles, Kokoshiba would say. Michikatsu, 
I'm sure that one day our descendants will be able to learn our breathing technique. After all, time doesn't stand still for anyone. The younger looking man said, he resembled Tandra's father a lot, yet he looked like a plant. He was a user of the see-through world, Tandra thought to himself. Michikatsu stomped off. He was agitated. I'm sure that the person who inherits our breathing techniques will be able to surpass us, the younger man said with a sigh. Tandro remembered the tale his father had told him about his younger brother, Yoroichi. Was this Yoroichi? Tandro thought, but yet again he was moved to another scene. It was a vast sea that he was standing on. Nothing surrounded him. If he remembered correctly, this was his subconscious where his soul resided. What was happening? On the outside, the Hashra had pinned down Tandro and were trying to knock him out by choking him. On the inside, however, he was following these little spirits. Thoughts ran through his mind at insane speeds, berating himself. He kept calling himself weak and an, and an imitator. If he was really a descendant from the Tsuji Clooney clan, why couldn't he make his own breathing style? Whilst moon breathing was greatly suitable to Tantro, it wasn't perfect. Neither was the Hinoka Mikagura or the so-called sun breathing. It just didn't fit him either. Tandros came face to face with a wall. The spirits turned around as they started walking away, in a direction headed to a black sun. It was burning quietly, but Tantro could feel the heat just from looking at it. He turned once more facing the wall, as he put his hand on it and walked through, casting away any doubts. After walking through, he found himself back in a familiar place. It was the memory he had with his father, the same one Enmu had shown him. But was this truly a memory? It felt more like a dream, whilst not feeling like one. Tondro walked to the lake to see his reflection, seeing his current self with his horn and sharp teeth. Did I become a demon? Tondro thought to himself. He turned around to see his father, yet he was gone. Instead, he saw himself, younger but still there. It didn't dawn on him how much he had changed. He had become much taller and stronger than he was in the past. You idiot. You have forgotten your goal. How could you fall to despair at a time like this? He, the younger version of himself, yelled out, punching him in the face. Whilst the punch didn't hurt, it sent Tondra in the air. And although he was only in the air for a few seconds, he remembered. He remembered everything. His happy family that got torn apart. The taunting Akaza did. The torment he felt after losing his siblings and his goal. His goal of saving his father and destroying Kibutsuji Muzan. He had fallen into the river. His younger self stood above him and looked down on him with a pleasant look. The real challenge starts now. So fight. On the outside, they were about to decapitate Tandro because he was growing another horn. However, a bright line shone from him. The Hashra that were holding him down had all been sent flying, though not far. They all watched as Tandro's figure engulfed in bright light walked towards where his blade was. He came to a stop in front of the blade. The light began to dim down until it fully dissipated. For a moment, everyone stood still as they saw Tandro, who had grown a bit taller. His hair had also changed. It had become a bit longer. Yet Tandro's expression remained calm. His eyes had returned to normal, and although there wasn't a big change, everybody could tell that he was completely different from before. His eyes had become a bit more reddish, almost crimson but not quite. He extended his hand and his blade returned to his hand in an instant. He pointed his sword at the Hashra. All of them were in rather good condition, having only some small cuts or bruises. Come at me, Tandro said in a calm yet threatening tone. The Hashra proceeded to just do that, all at once. Nezuko Inosuke Zinitsu and Kanoe joined in as well, being followed by the Tsugoko. They were all within striking distance of Tanjiro as they all focused their entire being on the attack. The atmosphere made them feel like if they slipped up, they would die. Tanjiro took a stance none of the Hashra recognized. Not even Gyutaro, who had learned most of the forms of moon breathing, recognized this stance. Eclipse breathing. First form. First quarter death parade. Tandro said as he zoomed past all the Hashra. Everybody got knocked out in an instant. Gutra looked a bit closer at Tandro and realized he had hit everybody with the blunt side of his sword. Tandro sheathed his weapon and left. Five minutes after Tandro had left Gyomei, the strongest Hashra got up. 
When he asked if he was all right, he explained what had happened. Kyome was blind, so he couldn't see the attack, but his other senses were enhanced to the point where he couldn't reach any higher ground. He explained that Tanro didn't even hit them. A force like pressure hit them, the force of which fell to Gyome like a train hitting them. He has reached an even higher plane than before, Gyome said, trying to catch his breath. The other Hashira began, began waking up. Shinobu woke up, exclaiming how cool and handsome Tanjiro was. The other Hashira looked at her with a dumbfounded expression. They weren't used to Shinobu fangirling over someone. Mitsuri helped Shinobu up as they both started talking about how cool Tanjiro's new breathing was, and how amazing it was to have someone as reliable as him on their side. When Nezuko woke up, she joined in, and most of the slayers started chatting about his strength and elegance. The other Hashra joined in as well. Gyome and Sanami started to chain a conversation discussing how they themselves could get stronger by taking his example. Whilst Obanai didn't join in, he seemed rather angry that Mitsuri was falling in love with Tanjiro. Meanwhile, Tanjiro arrived at Ubiyashiki's mansion, where he only said one sentence. I can make the gates that lead to Muzan. This changed the entirety of Ubiyashiki's plans, as he sent out the order right away. The growth started flying around spreading the word. Their attack on the Infinity Castle would commence within three weeks. This riled up the slayers who started training harder. The Hashra did the same. Everybody trained with Thandro multiple times to get way stronger as well. The Day of Reckoning came. All the slayers geared up. They each had a first aid kit and some items that would come in handy. Most slayers were now on the level of strength that some of the weaker Hashura had. This would greatly boost the strength of the demon slayers. Everyone got ready as Tantra extended his hand. Out of thin air, multiple doors appeared. Two Hashura would team up and following them would be the Tsugoko and the stronger slayers. Through each door, two Hashura entered. The last door was Tanjiro's. He entered together with Shinobu. Alongside him were Kanoe, Nezuko, Gyutaro, Inosuke, and some of the other slayers. They started running through the Infinity Castle. Tanjiro had made sure to drop each Hashira off in a safe zone, or at least a zone where he hardly felt any of the energy that he usually felt from demons. Once Tanjiro and his squad entered, they heard a voice. It was Muzan. <laughs> You fool, you actually came to us. Well, you wish your deaths will be slow and painful, the voice said as it disappeared. Tandra and his squad started running through the Infinity Castle. They'd find some demons and quickly dispose of them. Tandra remarked that these demons had the strength of upper moons, but they were extremely sluggish and demorphed. They continued on their move. Meanwhile, Giyu's squad, which consisted of himself, Rengoku, Genya, and some of the other others, ran into a Biwa demon. Her eye had the kanji for the number four. Rengoku took a stance and rushed at her. She quickly started playing her Biwa as doors started to open, flooding the room with demons. Everybody quickly stepped up as they started defeating the demons. Lots of these demons could be ranked as former lower moons and upper moons, yet again they were sluggish like they were made in a rush. They quickly took care of the demons and then rushed to the Biwa demon, decapitating her without much resistance. They had to perform first aid in their own group for the wounded slayers and continue on after that. Meanwhile, Himejima and Sanami were ticked off. They hadn't found a single demon yet. Not only that, but one of the members in their squad, Zenitsu, had gone rogue. Zenitsu heard a very distinct sound and ran towards it in the direction. He found the Upper Moon 6, Kaigaku. Well, if it isn't the useless Zenitsu, why have I gotten this visit, eh? The demon smirked. You know well enough that I was coming for you. How could you let Kibutsuji Muzan of all demons sway your mind? Zenitsu said as he prepared to go into a stance. Oh, shut up! How was I supposed to share the successor title with a weakling like you? All you know is the first form of thunder breathing. Not only that, but you cling to Tandro as a leech. You are a burden to people and you don't even realize it. Kaigaku would say, unleashing a furious attack against Zenitsu. However, Zenitsu easily dodged. Tandro acknowledged my strength. He taught me how to become stronger. And now you're just a weakling to me. A weakling that made Gramps take his life. 
Zinitsu would say as he unleashed an attack so fast that Kaikaku couldn't even react. However, the entire surroundings got blasted away. Thunder breathing, seven form. Onoi Kazuchi no Kami. Zenitsu said as he sheathed his blade. Kaigaku started disintegrating. He started berating both Zenitsu and their trainer, for teaching Zenitsu a move he didn't know. However, Zenitsu shut him up. I created this form, he said as he started making his way back to his squad. Kaigaku disintegrated, angry that he lost to someone like Zenitsu. Zenitsu got yelled at by Gyome and Tanami, however they told him that he did a good job. They knew this was a family matter. Obanai and Mitsuri had found a replacement demon for Upper Moon 5, though they made quick work of him. The final squad, Tengen and Muichiro's squad, were fighting and getting rid of all the lower and upper moon demons that were demorphed. There were a few demons that had adapted, but they got taken care of rather easily. It would take them a while to get rid of all these demons. Meanwhile, Tandro's squad ran into a demon. Upper Moon 2, Akaza. In a calm yet hatred-filled voice, Tandro looked at his squad and said one sentence. Go on without me. The rest of the squad did exactly that, as they followed Shinobu. Akaza watched them leave as he conf confidently stated that's fine, they'd be a nuisance anyway. Before he could continue speaking, Tantra would attack. Both of Akaza's hands would be sliced off in an instant. He was bewildered. He couldn't sense any fighting spirit from Tantra and he didn't even use the red-eyed form. What was going on? Akaza regrew his hands as he got into a stance, a final form he had been working on just for Tanjiro. Final form, annihilation type, death punch. Akaza would say sending a punch towards Tanjiro at insane speeds, a speed that could only be rivaled by someone like Kokoshibo. How pathetic. Tanjiro said as he got into a stance, his sword above his head arching like Rengoku's ninth form. Eclipse breathing, second form. Second quarter dark reflection, Tanjiro would say as he rushed forwards towards Akaza, his sword making a circular rotation which cut his arm off and stopped his attack. This wasn't looking good for Akaza, if he didn't run now he'd be screwed. I won't even finish you off with my strongest attack, that's how weak you are, Tanjiro said getting in Akaza's face. He was pissed off at that comment but when he looked into Tanjiro's eyes he saw death. He couldn't feel Tanjiro's bloodlust, but he could see it within the boy's eyes. Moon Breathing First Form Dark Moon Evening Palace Tanjiro would decapitate Akaza in an instant, and fulfill his promise of finishing him off with the first ever move he had learned. Akaza tried to regenerate, but it felt so useless. Why was he even trying? He wouldn't be able to fight Tanjiro anyways. He deserved this for the hell he had brought upon Tandro and his family. In that moment, he remembered his human past as he cried and crumbled away. Tandro didn't spare any sympathies. He didn't have time to do something like that. He continued on his way as he ran through the countless halls. Look how hard these demon slayers are trying to beat us. Isn't it funny, Kokoshibo? Muzan spoke as he looked over his shoulder. There, Kokoshibo hung from chains his body being tortured every waking second, yet he didn't lose the hatred in his eyes. Come now, fight alongside me. It's not too late. I'll even consider sparing your family. How about it, Kokoshibo? Muzan spoke with a sly tongue. Are you scared? Scared that they will kill you? Kokoshibo laughed as he saw Muzan's face turn to anger. If you won't help me, you won't be of use to me. Muzan spoke as he extended his hand. However, in that moment, an axe would narrowly miss his face. He backed up, seeing that two Hashra now stood in front of him. He looked over to see a bunch of other demon slayers as well. One quickly approached Kokoshibo, and although he was terrified, he inserted a medicine within the upper moon's body. Muzan felt it. His connection to Kokoshibo. He was losing it. You vermin, get out of my way, he'd say, releasing a devastating attack. However, both Sanami and Gyome intervened and deflected the attack. Gyome popped out his arms as his mark appeared. 
Koko Shibo, who was watching, was saddened. This man who had reached the pinnacle of human strength would die after tonight. After all, everyone who had the mark would die at the age of 25. Koko Shibo would have to recover some strength if he would want to break out of his change. The slayers around him looked preoccupied with Muzan. However, he heard a distinct voice. Thunder breathing, first form, thunderclap and flash, sixfold. Sinitu would say, cutting all the chains, binding Kogoshibo in an instant. He stood in front of the upper moon, facing Muzan's direction. Sir, your son has helped me a lot. He's on his way. We just have to defeat Muzan and this will all be over, Sinitu would say in a stoic manner, as he rushed towards Muzan like all the other slayers. Kokoshibo, who was now sitting on the ground, was bewildered by these children. Meanwhile, Shinobu and the rest of her group came into contact with Doma. Their fight started. Shinobu knew that this was the demon that had hurt her sister, but it was fine. With this, she'd be able to get revenge. She, alongside Kanoe, started fighting the Upper Moon rigorously. From fighting Tandro, they had learned a lot, as to not give anybody an opening. Whenever Shinobu stabbed Doma, it would inflict the poison she had made onto Doma, which seemed to be very effective. Doma being pushed into a corner would start fighting Sirius, although when the other slayers started helping out, he was pretty much cornered. Even when Inosuke's mask came off and Doma taunted him, it ended up being worse for him, as Inosuke remembered his memories and started fighting more vigorously. He would turn purple as he would start disintegrating. Right before disappearing completely, he'd send a concentrated attack towards Shinobu, wanting her to join him in the afterlife. It ended up hitting her as she was too off guard and too exhausted to dodge. She was losing blood fast, and from where the ice attack had hit her, she would start freezing. Everybody around her started crying as she seemed like she was gonna die. She patted Kanoe as she spoke. Don't mind me. I'll just be moving on first. She'd say this with a smile. However, a loud crash could be heard. The dust settled as Tandro came running out of it, arriving next to Shinobu. I'm sorry, my love. It's over for me, she'd say, putting her hand on Tandro's cheek. He had other plans, though. He kissed her. It wasn't an ordinary kiss, he basically force-fed her his blood. Simultaneously, he'd start reversing the blood demon art that was affecting her. She slowly started healing, until she fully recovered. She laid there unconscious for a second, until she opened her eyes. They had changed, they had more color. She had become a demon under Tanjiro, in a sense. Kanoe hugged Tanjiro and thanked him, as Shinobu just stared at him confused. We don't have time to get into details. We need to go help the others. He'd say, getting up. They performed first aid on some slayers. Meanwhile, Mitsuri and Obanai helped Tengen and Muichiro's group. With four Hashra, they cleaned up the demons rather quickly. There were an unreasonable amount of them, and not helping would have just exhausted the other two more. After they beat all the demons, they made their way to Muzan, arriving pretty fast. Giyu's squad arrived as well. Genya instantly pulled out his western-style gun. They had developed a special type of bullet for him to use against Muzan. This was possible because of Tamiyo and Shinobu, alongside some swordsmiths and Gyutaro. One pellet of the bird shot he had at the same amount of one dosage of the medicine, so if he could hit one shot on Muzan, the fight would turn around. All the Hashra started attacking Muzan. Everybody tried pinning him down. Muzan would stretch out his back tentacles and his arms as he wounded most of the slayers. Yet the Hashra didn't give in. Each one used their ultimate move, as they pinned Muzan's tentacles. His regeneration slowed down because of their red blades. This battle was really spectacular. Kokoshibo was handed a sword by a few crows. It was within a black box. When he opened it, he found a Nitrin sword that had been specially crafted for him. This definitely was something that Tanjiro had made with Moonbreathing in mind. He gripped the sword and it turned bloodshot 
crimson red as he rushed at Muzan alongside the Slayers. He had already adapted to their combos as he himself used to train with each breathing user to improve. With Kokoshibo's help, they were able to make an opening for Genya, who was able to get three shots in. The first were two medicine, one that would start changing Muzan back into a human, and another which would rapidly age him. The second shot introduced two more drugs, which would have effect later on in the fight. The third shot was a shot that would make trees sprout from Muzan. He got rid of them rather quickly. He was enraged. He unleashed an, a shockwave that would knock all the slayers back. If he wanted a chance at winning, he'd need to take care of Kokoshibo first. So long, Kokoshibo, Muzan said as he was about to strike Kokoshibo. At that moment, a loud noise could be heard. Eclipse breathing, third form. Half sun destruction. In an instant, Tanjiro appeared behind Muzan as multiple slashes appeared on Muzan's body, most of them hitting his old scars. It burned, it hurt, it was hell. Muzan was in pure agony. He turned around to see Tanjiro standing there. Both his eyes were red and his scar was burning black. What was this form, Muzan thought to himself. However, he didn't have much time to think. Tanjiro took another stance. This one seemed more familiar. It was that man's swordsmanship. Muzan tried to run, however, the Hashra, who had recovered, came in and pinned him down once more. Sun breathing, first form. Dance, Tanjiro slashed Muzan once more, the demon progenitor crying out in pain. Why did his attack burn so much? It hurt even more than Yoroichi's attack, was what Muzan thought. Nezuko and the others of Tanjiro's group arrived. She quickly hugged her father, who cried when she embraced him. Tanjiro had his full focus on Muzan, however. We'll talk after this is all over, he said as he got in another stance. Eclipse breathing, fourth form. Four quarter link chain. Tanjiro said as he rushed past the Hashra at insane speeds. He'd slash upward. Muzan, who barely dodged, got cut all throughout his chest, and even part of his chin got cut. His regeneration decreased severely, however, his counter attack started. He'd send out countless slashes and even send out a shockwave. Tanjiro quickly dodged the attacks while still rushing at Muzan. He'd kick the progenitor upwards with such force that he'd be sent through the ground, or, well, roof. Dawn will approach in 30 minutes, a crow yelled out. All the Hashra and Slayers made their way to the surface. The medicine that Kokoshibo had received had made him a demon that was under Tanjiro, making him immune to the sun. It was partially infused with his blood and other things that they had figured out. So Kokoshibo didn't fear going to the surface. The fight started once more. Everyone rushed at Muzan. Whenever he attacked, the stronger slayers would get in the way and either block or parry the blow. With Kokoshibo's help, the fight was a lot easier. His moon-breathing forms also repelled a lot of Muzan's attacks. The sword that he had gotten was even better than his demon art sword. He remembered a lot whilst fighting Muzan. He felt regret for how he treated his brother. Why did he have to be this greedy, he thought. They should have just beaten Muzan years ago and ended these tragedies. Muzan was cornered. He couldn't do anything. This was the end, yet he got attacked constantly. He knew he wouldn't be able to escape. Tanjiro and Kokushibo would already be enough to take care of him. He was now basically being tortured. He tried to turn some of the slayers into demons, but his attempts failed. Eclipse breathing, fifth form, five quarter, eight deaths, Tantra would say cutting Muzan into eight different vital points. Before Muzan could even regenerate, Tantra came back in with another technique. Eclipse breathing, sixth form, half resonance, he'd say performing a clean center cut on Muzan. Eclipse breathing, seven form, seven quarter blaze, Tantra said following up with another move, this time amputating Muzan. Kokoshiba didn't sit still either as he came in with a moon-breathing form, to be precise, the first form, almost decapitating Muzan. Some of the Hashra came in and performed their moves, like Sanami used his Iraten Typhoon. Tanjiro started turning a lot as he took a breath. 
Eclipse breathing, eighth form, eight quarter god ender. He'd say, rotating at insane speeds until his blade hit moves on vertically with insane power, sending the demon progenitor into the air. The sun started rising as Muzan tried extending his tentacles to launch himself away at, at high speed. However, Tandro took a stance similar to Thunder Breathing. Eclipse Breathing, Ninth Form, Infinite Torment. He'd say speeding past Muzan, dicing up his arms into tiny pieces that started to disintegrate. Muzan tried desperately to change his fate, however when he looked up he saw that Tandro had another move coming. Eclipse Breathing Tenth form, blazing eclipse. Tandro said as his blade caught on fire, the color of which was black, as he cleanly sliced Muzan in two. His regeneration stopped. He started disintegrating from the black flames. Although not fast, he couldn't do anything. The sun was up and he disintegrated. Tandro landed on the ground. The fight was over. Kibutsuji Muzan had been defeated. There were almost no casualties, the ones that did die got a proper burial. Kokoshibo got relief from his sins, he'd have to spend his remainder of his life helping people out, which he wanted to do either way. There, Gyome got saved by Tanjiro, who used his energy-based art to seal away his mark. Gyome thanked Tanjiro. The fight ended in a massive win for the Slayers. After another month, the Demon Slayer Corps disbanded. However, a lot of the Slayers who wanted to keep working under the Demon Slayer Corps and under Tandro ended up protesting. So, Ubiashiki decided that a new company would be established, one that would keep the world safe. They kept the same name. Tantra ended up becoming one of the leaders in this organization. Most of the other Hashira retired, retired though, with good reasons. Obanai and Mitsuri got married, whilst Giyu went and became a swordsmanship teacher. Yome stayed, together with Sanami and Genya, and Rengoku also stayed. Tengen retired to be with his three wives, and Shinobu stayed as well, wanting to be with Tanjiro. Muichiro stayed as well, as he didn't really have anything else to do, and he wanted to stay with Tanjiro, wanting to learn more from him. And so time passed. A world war happened, which the Demon Slayer Corps stopped, and the white public came to worship the Tsujikuni family as gods. And Japan ended up becoming one of the world's superpowers. The world turned out amazingly, with geniuses such as Shinobu and other people being turned into demons under Tanjiro. They were, they were able to grow medical fields and other fields of research, and so thousands of years passed. An old-looking man was sitting on his porch together with his wife. They were enjoying the nice summer breeze together. Oh, Tanjiro, what a crazy life we lived, the older-looking woman would say with a smile. What a crazy life indeed, but we did our best throughout it all, Alt Tanjiro would say with a smile on his face. He had already gotten a successor, so he was retired. What a crazy life indeed, my love, Shinobu would say before she started disintegrating. Tanjiro wept a tear but smiled. I'll see you on the other side, my love, he'd say as he held her hand till the end. After she was gone, he'd look out from his porch to the wild world that was before him. He smiled as he closed his eyes. He, the thoughts about his life ran through his head. His first son and daughter taking their steps, the world accepting everybody equally, his father's passing, and so, so much more. Happy and sad thoughts, but he was glad. He had no regrets. He smiled with his eyes closed as he softly entered a sleep. He disintegrates slowly and meets Shinobu in the afterlife. The end. And that marks the end of What If Tanjiro Was Koko Shibo's Son, the movie. Now, if you guys enjoyed this series, do like and subscribe. If you watched the entire thing, comment down below that you did. And if you haven't already, join the Discord and join the Roblox group. Both are at the top of the description, and with that out of the way, my name is the Dragon Lord, and I am signing out.